simple idea, really, on the kind of overall like that. We do all kinds of actions based on delusion and ignorance. We get reborn. When we get reborn, we do more actions based on ignorance and delusion, and then we get reborn again, and so on, ad infinitum, potentially. So do we want to do that ad infinitum? That's the question. So having that as a background, now we're going to come to the myths. OK, so these are a, ser a series of myths or misconceptions. And as I mentioned before, these are quite prevalent. You'd be surprised how prevalent these ideas are in the modern world. So I think it's quite useful to go through them and to, uh, in a sense, put them next to the suttas and ask ourselves the question, how much, to what extent do they match with what the suttas teach? So these are, in quick order, the myths that we're going to have a look at. Uh, number one, dependent origination happens in one lifetime. Yeah, it is all, all the 12 links are within one life, and dependent origination is not about rebirth. Yeah, this is a very common thing, and I uh, think one reason that I mentioned last time why it is so common is because when people come to the Buddhist teaching from a new context, this is specifically especially common in the Western world. You come from a Western, Western idea, and you have kind of rejected things that you think are superstition, yeah, religions or whatever it is, and you have a philosophical outlook that is very Western, then the idea of rebirth doesn't make any sense. Yeah, when you die, that's it, everything ends, and kind of that's the kind of outlook. So very often we bring that baggage, or we bring that background with us when it comes to the Buddhist teachings, then we, that infiltrates our understanding of this teaching. It slants the way we look at it, it biases our view of the Buddhist teachings. So this is one of the reasons why you get these kind of views. And we will have a look soon at how it matches up with, uh, with, Bud with the EBTs. Uh. Yes. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> Excellent. Number one, uh, dependent origination is a momentary thing. It is the arising of mental phenomena one after the other. This is like a subgroup of the first one. Yeah, these are very closely related to each other. And this is another very common understanding in the modern world. And the reason why it is common, as we shall see, is that the Buddha often talks about the, uh, how we experience the world. And, and how we experience the world can be divided up into certain steps yeah, of the mind moving in steps. And then people say, well, this movement of the mind in steps, it has certain affinities uh, with dependent origination. And for that reason, this is one way of understanding the idea of dependent origination. So the question then is, is that really correct from an EBT point of view? Huh? Dependent origination is uh, circular. Huh? And uh, this is a very common view. And if you just Google on, on uh, you know, you, and you look at... Uh, what the Mr. Google or Mrs. Google, I'm not sure which one, uh, uh, says, then straight away, very often you find this idea of circularity, yeah? and how kind of, uh, when you come to death, that goes back again to avijja. But is that really appropriate from an EBT perspective? Huh? Rebirth, independent origination requires a, a self. This is a broader idea that if you have, uh, you cannot have rebirth without a self. We need something which goes across, otherwise the idea of rebirth makes no sense, according to some people. Is that right? Dependent origination is stopped between feeling and craving. If you think back to the sequence we had before, we had the uh, sensation and we had craving afterwards. Uh, and it's quite a common idea that you cut dependent origination between these two factors. Uh, is that really right or not? Uh, and or is, if it is right, how, to what extent is it right? Uh, dependent origination means everything is interconnected. Uh, this is quite a common view. Sometimes it's a view you find in other, some certain schools of Buddhism. Uh, and if you look at, uh, again, if you go to the there's a uh, Wikipedia article uh, on dependent origination, and it talks specifically about this particular view. Uh, so we're going to have make see if that actually makes any sense. Uh, and the last one is that uh, dependent origination is too intellectual. Yeah, it's all about thinking and all kind of things, and you just think and think and think, and you you know that's going to trap you in samsara rather than get you out. Uh, so what is the point of uh, studying dependent origination here? Okay. So is that 
Does that sound good? Adrian, can I emphasize, yeah? you, you already Please. said this before, but when we yeah. are like debunking these kind of uh, myths, we call them myths just for, just for fun basically, but when we do so, we don't mean to uh, say that these kind of views cannot be helpful in some way because people teach these kinds of things for a reason and they are, they can be helpful from some point of view, but what we are trying to do is go back to the uh, Buddha's view that we find in the earliest texts and that may not agree with some of these things as we'll see later. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. Well, they, they may, sometimes they may even agree with the early Buddhist text, but they may not agree specifically with dependent origination, yeah? So, it, yeah, so yeah, it's even yeah. broader, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's uh, fire away. Let's go to the first one of these myths, yeah? And that is the myth that uh, dependent origination happens in one life. And uh, uh, this is, uh, I think, a very important point, yeah, whether something actually, whether it means rebirth or not, actually is a massive difference, uh, because uh, uh, if everything happens within one life, uh, then in a sense you are liberated when you die, yeah? and that's, you know, it's not no big problem, but if you, can, if you get reborn, actually the problem is potentially far, far vaster as a consequence. So uh, this is a very important point to sort out, uh, pr maybe perhaps the most important one of all the points that we're going to bring up. Uh, and that's why we put it first, to make that uh, the main kind of uh, thing this morning on myth-busting here. So does it make any sense? So now we're going to have a look at a number of reasons why this, not, why this is not make sense from the early Buddhist text point of view. Uh, one of the problems that you often have when you think about dependent origination in one life is this particular problem, also known as YOLO. This is the YOLO problem. You only live once, yeah, YOLO, kind of uh, one of these internet things. Uh, I never heard it before I saw it on the internet, but anyway, do what you want. Yeah, you only have one life to live. This is taken straight from a Google search. You search Google, uh, and this is what you get. Yeah, when you search for YOLO, you only live once. Uh, so this is kind of the idea. That sounds a bit dangerous, doesn't it? Uh, you can do whatever you want. Well, yeah, you know, sure, enjoy your life, but uh, you know, be, be careful as well. So if this idea of only one life is wrong, it probably will have some very significant consequences. Uh, yeah? And this is uh, uh, why this really matters. Uh. So let's just fire away at the first reason why this doesn't work. Uh. And this is about the very nature of suffering, according to the suttas. Uh, how does the Buddha define the idea of dukkha, dukkha being suffering? Uh, and uh, this will kind of be a very important point. Uh, and the reason is because dependent origination is all about suffering. Yeah? So if we understand the nature of suffering, we must also, by extension, understand something about the nature of dependent origination. These two, two things go together here. Yeah. So, um, uh, so what does the Buddha have to say about suffering? Actually, the first quote I have here is not from the Buddha. It is, actually, well, let's see what happens next. Oh, okay, yeah. So dependent origination shows why there is suffering. Yeah, this is the last link. So it shows the causal sequence, how suffering comes about. That's the purpose of dependent origination, its aim. And uh, because it shows what suffering is, and suffering in the suttas, almost everywhere, is defined as samsaric existence. Yeah, samsara is this... Uh, Pali word, which means like the kind of the moving on, yeah, the, the rolling on, if you like, yeah? and the idea is that you go from birth to death, from birth to death, yeah, you carry on, you carry on like that. Yeah? So it includes the idea of rebirth, and this is a very important point that suffering in Buddhism ultimately is very, very closely related to this particular point. Yeah? In fact, when you read the suttas and you, you see that one of the things that when you become an arahant, when you finally come to the end of the path, you're fully awakened, yeah, you know, ev you know everything there is from a spiritual point of view. When you become an arahant, what is it that you know? And there is one knowledge that is always spoken of for arahantship, and that is the knowledge that birth has come to an end. Yeah? This is the significant one. This is the knowledge, because birth has come to an end is equivalent to suffering ha having come to an end in the suttas. Yeah? They're very, very closely related to each other. So when the Arahant thinks, yay, birth has come to an end. I don't know if Arahant say that, I don't know. 
Do I want to say that? Yay? In Pro the suttas they do. They do in oh, the suttas. Yay, yay, yeah. they don't say yay. Yeah, yeah. They say yay, yay, okay. Yeah. okay. <laughs> they they don't, definitely don't say YOLO. They don't say yo, okay, but yo, they yo. might say yay, yo. okay, okay. Okay, so we, we're a little, little bit unsure what Arahan said, but they say something in ballpark like that. So they are really, but suffering has come to an end means rebirth has come to an end. Rebirth has come to an end means suffering has come to an end. It's a very fundamental aspect of these teachings. And uh, what is so fascinating, sometimes when you hear people trying to make the case that dependent origination is about one life, uh, what it amounts to, because the idea of rebirth is so interconnected in all the suttas, uh, if you try to draw rebirth out of the suttas, basically you have to rewrite the whole Dhamma. You have to rewrite it with your entirely new ideas. Yeah? So you have things like, yeah, actually, you know, when the Buddha says that craving leads to suffering, this is actually what one person says, yeah? When craving leads to suffering, yeah, I don't think that's quite right, you know? I think he got that the wrong way. Actually, it's suffering that leads to craving. Yeah. <laughs> so then I think, um, you're turning it upside down, yeah? It's the exact opposite of what it used to be here. Yeah? Is that, can we do that? Four Noble Truths, this is like a fundamental aspect of Buddhism. If instead of calling it craving leads to suffering, you say suffering leads to craving, yeah, you, are, are we really dealing with the Buddha's word, or are we dealing with the word of this particular person who says this? This is the kind of problem you encounter, because the whole teaching of Buddhism, take out rebirth, is one of the pillars that makes the entire teaching stand up. Take away one of the pillars of what this teaching is about, and the whole thing really collapses, and you have to rewrite it from scratch. Yeah, this is a very, very big problem. So you cannot really take these things out of the teaching without you know, it having very, very serious consequences. Actually, you don't have Buddhism anymore, you have something else. Yeah? You have like the uh, ven venerable so-and-so religion, yeah? or, the, or the whatever it is. So very, uh, a very important point, and it really matters enormously. But of course, you can argue that suffering leads to craving. Yeah? It is not the wrong argument, it's just not about the Four Noble Truths. If you suffer, yeah, you know what it's like? Oh, I better go to the fridge and find something nice to eat. Yeah? Oh, too much dukkha. You know what it's like? Yeah, the, and the Buddha says this in the suttas. If you have suffering, yeah, where do you look for the escape from suffering? Yeah, you look for it in the sensual realm. Yeah? This is what ordinary people look for the escape from suffering. Yeah? Not the Aryas, not the noble ones, but the ordinary people. That's where they look. Yeah? And you can see that happening. Yeah, you're suffering too much, you want to distract yourself, you watch something, you enjoy something, and then these things happen. Yeah? But it is really a strong distortion of Buddhist teachings. Yeah? So let's uh, have a look at uh, some of the examples from the sutta, just to kind of make sure we bring it back to the EBTs at all times. Yeah? So you have, uh, yeah, this is a famous saying. This is, uh, uh, I think, Ajahn Brahm who originally pointed this out to me. And this is Venerable Sariputta speaking. And he says, and uh, he's asked the question, what is suffering? Uh, what is happiness? Uh, yeah? And this is his answer. Rebirth is suffering. Uh, yeah? No rebirth is happiness. Uh, so it linked to the very basic idea of uh, uh, suff suffering and happiness, the idea of rebirth. Uh. Here's another one. So this starts with mendicants. You know the word mendicants? Yeah, if you see the word mendicants, you know, Ajahn Sujato, Ajahn Sujato. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody else uses the word mendicants. Uh, he's, he's the only one in the, the known universe to use mendicants. Uh, so, um, so this is his translation, yeah? And I, I quite like his translations because they are very, they're quite straightforward, except for the a few words like mendicants, except for that, they're quite straightforward and nice translations. Yeah. <laughs> so he says, uh, mendicants, transmigration has no known beginning. From being united with the unloved and separated from the loved, the flow of tears you've shed while roaming and transmigrating here is indeed more than the water in the four oceans. These days we probably would say seven oceans, but anyway, that's the four oceans at that time. And this is one of those uh, classical sayings in the sutta that's very well known. This is quoted quite often in, from the suttas. Uh, but this idea that you carry on, yeah, you transmigrate, you carry on from life to life. This is really uh, ultimately what suffering is about. And it's very obvious here. Yeah, the amount of tears you have cried uh, more than the water in the four oceans. Uh, I don't know if you have ever done the calculation. Uh, I, I always say to people, you should do the calculation. You should cry. You should have a bowl and cry into the bowl. Uh, 
you should weigh, measure it afterwards, and then compare it to the water in the oceans, and then you can get some idea of the number of lifetimes. Yeah? And it's more than that, so it's, uh, that just gives you a baseline here. So this is the idea. Suffering in Buddhism, the very, what it really is about is rebirth. It's about this eternal uh, going around, this carrying on and on and on. If it, is, if it were only one life, if we were to, you know, this, we died after this and we were finished with it, it wouldn't be such a big deal. Yeah? Even if we suffered a little bit, uh, we could somehow deal with it. It's this whole idea of things carrying on, which really is so, uh, so concerning and so wor worrying here. Yeah. And Masunia, would you like to add something here? Well, the suttas add a lot to this. That's, uh, we, we cannot really do justice to how, how central rebirth is in the sutta in this course because we can only show you a few quotes. So uh, I would really encourage everybody to read the suttas, the Buddhist early texts for themselves. They're available for free now with Ajahn Shujata's translations. And you'll see how important rebirth is to the Buddha's teachings. It's, it's really everywhere. And the more you read the suttas, the more you see like this, the small hints at rebirth. Yeah. And uh, Given that rebirth is so central to the Buddha's uh, teachings, that must mean that dependent origination must say something about that as well, because that is also so central. And there's also many suttas that actually directly mention rebirth in the context of dependent origination. And one that I like a lot is uh, where uh, Ananda says to the Buddha, oh, I, I get dependent origination, and then the Buddha says, well, don't say it in that way because for people it's very hard to understand depend, dependent origination because by not de understanding dependent origination they get reborn in all these all these realms again and again and it's very literal you can't really interpret that in some kind of one lifetime interpretation those kind of texts it's very obvious what the buddha is talking about there is the, the rebirth from one life to the next and that happened through not understanding dependent origination fully. So dependent origination, therefore, is clearly must be an explanation of this rebirth principle. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and uh, I, you know, I would add to that that sometimes when you encourage people to read the suttas, they say, oh no, too difficult for me here. I don't understand anything. It's just uh, that's what I was possible. like at one point. Yeah. We, we, we all, we all been there probably to some extent. Uh, but uh, one of the things that you find when you start reading the suttas is that there are certain things that you pick up straight away because it kind of stares in your face. Yeah? The importance of sila, the importance of samadhi, the significance of, of rebirth. There are certain things that you kind of, one sutta after the other. And the, so straight away you learn a lot by reading the suttas, even if you don't understand everything here, yeah? even if there are some words that are really difficult to understand. Yeah? So there's a lot of what they call low-hanging fruits yeah, that you kind of get straight away because you... Uh, because it's kind of uh, so, so obvious, it's staring you in the face, basically. Yeah. Would this be a good point for questions, I think? Uh, absolutely. Let's have a short meditation first, of the matter. Yeah. And then we can have some questions. So let's just have a five minutes meditation, and then we uh, get to the questions.
Let's uh, carry on now. Okay, so uh, I don't know, I think it's nice to have little breaks to kind of allow the material to sink in a little bit. Uh, so that's why we decided to do this. Uh, are there any uh, questions or comments uh, from anyone here? Anyone like, like to say anything here? Nicholas, over here. Yeah. Just wait for the microphone, please, Nicholas. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe bring that up again once we get there, Nicholas, because coming to that, that uh, misconception very soon. Uh, yeah. So, Ananda. <laughs> so, they have Ananda in front here, at the very front. Yeah. The wrong view, uh, uh, mitad, mitadity. That's the first question. Whether, whether they are wrong view? Huh? Yes. Yeah, I, actually, it's a very good point. I, I, I was going to say something. I didn't. I didn't for some reason. I guess it slipped my mind. But yes, it's a. I think a very important point that these are all rooted in wrong view, really, yeah. because you know, right view, part of right view, is the idea of you know carrying on of, of rebirth as part of right view in Buddhism. So they are rooted in a, in a wrong view of the, of the world, and certainly a wrong view of the suttas, yeah, of what the Buddha taught. Uh, so I, I would say so, yes. Uh, they could also be, uh, you know, it's, it is, as, as we mentioned before, that uh, some of the ideas are just uh, using dependent origination in a new way. Yeah. And in that sense, it may not be a wrong view. But, but uh, if you do deny rebirth, then certainly it is uh, about wrong view. Uh, yeah. Yep. It, it does even, some, some of them seems to be touching on the worldly, uh, in, not the mundane, uh, super mundane, mundane wrong view as well. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah. the second one, Ajahn, on the rebirth, yeah. um, uh, just trying to remember, I think you mentioned that people seem to be wanting to throw the, I think you used the word uh, at one time, uh, throwing the baby with the bath water, yeah. I think in one of your sutra retreats. Yeah. So, um, it, it seems that, uh, would it be right that, I think it is in the Jnana Vattu Sutta, Buddha said, two types of knowledge, yeah. uh, the uh, Dhamma Jnana and Anve Jnana, yeah, yeah. uh, true knowledge and the inferential knowledge. I think it is there he, 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 he mentioned about the rebirth as well. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, for us, I think, uh, when we can't see the <laughs> previous lives, yeah. he said, look at this. And then also we can see last time also you mentioned, Ajahn Ram also has mentioned that yeah. uh, number of times uh, Professor Stevenson's work and all yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, if you yeah. look at all that, sometimes we will come across in our own life, the people very close to us yeah. who recall and then apply that uh, Anve Jnana yeah, yeah. and we could see. Just yeah. want your views, Ajahn. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's true. I, the Buddha talks about uh, what he calls, you know, Anvanana, which means, uh, Anva means like, a, you know, a, a, it's an, um, knowledge. Jnana means knowledge. And Anva is like that comes along with, some, knowledge that comes along with something else. Uh, so you have the Dhamma Jnana, which is the insight, but that insight has consequences. And those consequences is what you call inferential knowledge or Anvaya Jnana. So it means that, for example, if you see a truth in the moment, you can apply that truth also to the past and the future, because you understand that this is a universal truth. And this is how you know. So you see that there is rebirth, you understand how rebirth happens. And then you also know, well, this must be the case then for also for the future and the past, because the, the same conditions would apply at all times. Uh, and you kind of have some understanding. It's like gravity, you know, in, in, the, in physics. Yeah? Okay, there's gravity. Now there probably was gravity yesterday as well. Yeah? Otherwise, it wouldn't make any sense. So you have that. But that is called inferential knowledge uh, that you apply. This is specifically what it means in the sutta, as you apply it to the future and the past uh, in that way. And then, of course, that's how you get the idea of rebirth, because you have an insight in the present moment. Uh, and you know that it must apply to, to all time. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, I think I have two competing ones now, I think. Yeah. Who is first? Uh, who, okay. Tom, you want to fire away? Yeah. Yeah, Ajahn. Um, 
Venerable Sunya said about a, because the samsara is all I'm the realms, I'm this glad. particular gross realm is the small realm compared to all the other realms that we can be reborn in. So, but in this particular form, do we have the best chance of liberation? Because we want to drop the whole heavenly realm structure. We don't want to be reborn in heaven or hell. We want to drop the whole structure, right? So in this particular form, do we have the best sort of chance to, to fulfill that task? Well, you definitely have a good chance by coming to this workshop, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> yeah, there is this idea that the uh, human realm is uh, like the best realm to, uh, to understand the Dhamma. Uh, it's interesting, I think, don't think that's mentioned anywhere in the Sutta specifically, but there, it makes some sense because the Buddha was a human, right? So he understood it as a human, so it implies that it's probably a very good uh, rebirth as a human is good to understand the Dhamma. But also, these teachings we have here uh, available now that come down from the Buddha, if you were reborn in uh, another realm or maybe as an animal or whatever, you wouldn't be able to hear them, you wouldn't understand them. There, there may be some uh, flies in this room <laughs> listening, but they don't understand, right? They don't understand English, so for that reason also, it's good to be reborn as a human. Having said that though, in, there is also uh, in the suttas quite a few references where higher beings than humans, they understand the Dhamma, like some of the devas and things, so yeah, maybe those realms may be uh, beneficial as well. Yeah. Because if you read the Ajahn Man autobiography, like there's thousands upon thousands of devas came to him for teachings you know, on, on a regular basis, and, uh, and the Nagas and all those sort of things. But when he reached enlightenment, all the previous Buddhas with all their Arahants came to congratulate him. So after, like, what are we freeing ourselves from? And like, if, we, if this samsara is a limited sort of vibrational realm, what happens, as a, what happens to Arahants? Like, if they can, where do they go? Like, what actually happens after the freedom from samsara? Yeah, that is a... Uh Interesting question. One thing that wouldn't happen is they wouldn't actually come back to teach because the, when rebirth end, the uh, five khandas, which make up an aran, they end as well. So I'm, that, that autobiography w wasn't actually an autobiography. It was written by, not by Ajahn Man, by somebody else. Ajahn Mahabua, which yeah, was one so of his students. I am very, uh, what is the English word? I'm very uh, skeptical of that, yeah. And one thing is for sure, there wouldn't have been Arahans that came to teach him, because the Arahans, would, when they die, they, don't, they cannot come back again. Yeah, yeah they can. There's, 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 there's Arahans that have come back and chosen another body, just not in Buddhism. There's yogis that have done that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's right, they won't be reborn again, so... Reborn in samsara. Yeah, 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 yeah. But Nibbana, the word Nibbana means going out, uh, like a flame going out. That's what you use the word Nibbana for in the Buddha's time, when a flame goes out, it Nibbanas. And, and if we see a flame going out, does it go anywhere? No, it doesn't go anywhere. It just goes out, you know. You could say it disappears, it stops. And this is the same for an Arahant. Arahant even the word arahant implies some sort of entity, like because arahant is a noun, it sounds like a thing. But human beings, including arahants and all other beings actually also, we are not really things, we are more like processes, just like a flame. It's not, it's not a thing, you can't really grab it and put it in a box. It's, it's, a, it's a process, and processes, they can have an end to them. Yeah. without anything specifically being destroyed when a flame goes out nothing is annihilated right but it's a process that ends and this is the same when somebody becomes enlightened and then they pass away this is also the process that's ending 
when, once that process is ending, there is no more, no more craving and there for no more force or say energy for them to uh, come back again. So we may disagree on that point, but that's how I interpret it anyway, and that's how I see it. So we want to stop identifying with that process and let it burn out so that we don't, so it doesn't keep going, but we don't want to add to it. Yes, exactly. Yeah, this is actually a point that comes back in the Panda Regeneration as well. When we look at the link of Upadana, we'll look at that much later down the course, but Upadana means fuel as well as taking up. And this fuel is like we keep the process going by adding fuel to the fire, as it were. Yeah. Thank you. Should we maybe, let's stop there. I'm afraid we're going to go too long because we probably keep on all day with questions and answers, I think. So let's just, let's just stop there. And we can come back to, we're going to come back regularly to questions. So please don't, uh, if you want to ask, just bring it up again later. Maybe briefly this one from the internet. I, can, I think I can answer it quickly. So it's about this quote that's on the slide here. That, therefore, it's good to answer it now. Rebirth is suffering. No rebirth is happiness. Question mark. No rebirth should be existent, therefore no happiness or sadness. I think the, why is it written as happiness? I think the uh, question is here, if there is no rebirth, how can you experience happiness? And this is a bit of a, a definition of happiness is different for the Buddha than for uh, most other beings. And it's one in the sutta specifically says that by happiness the Buddha means wherever you can find some ease and the word for happiness in this text is actually is the word sukha, which also can be translated in various ways. Sukha is the opposite of dukkha, basically. So happiness sounds more like an emotion to me anyway. So when you say no rebirth is happiness, it sounds like a bit like when you're not reborn, do you feel happy emotion? And that's not the point of this quote. You could also translate it as no rebirth means ease or no, no rebirth means no suffering, basically. So, yeah. that's a brief answer. But yeah, or you could say that uh, uh, that uh, no feeling is superior to feeling. Yeah. If you don't feel anything, that's considered a better state than feeling. Yeah. It's a preferable state because it's preferable. It's happier even if you don't actually feel anything. It's a preferable state. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a couple more questions. How do I get access to the? Word document behind here. How do you do that? Oh. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just going to ask there's a couple of more questions that came actually before the class. I'm going to ask them very briefly. I don't want to spend too much time because we're going to go too, too long here. Yeah. So um, um, one of the questions is about the distinction between what is called in the sutta as dependently arisen things and dependent origination. Yeah? Paticca samupanna dhamma versus paticca samupada. So the dependently arisen things, they are like the 12, each of the factors in the path. Yeah? So you have uh, sankhara is dependently arisen. It's a thing that arises dependent on something else. Uh, Consciousness is dependently arisen thing because it arises dependent on something else. Uh, Paticca samupada is the linkage between these things. Uh, the linkage between the dependently arisen things. Uh, so the th thing is the element of your personality, whereas the paticca samupada is the uh, arising, is, is the connection. Yeah, is the connection between things. Uh, so that is the difference. Yeah. So uh, so basically. Uh, so one is about conditionality, and the other one is just the elements of, of ex experience. Uh, and then there is a reference to a sutta here. This is a sutta in the Sangyutta Nikaya, where it seems to say that uh, avidja, or uh, ignorance, conditions, uh, willed activities, that this is the definition of, of dependent origination. But actually it's not. If you look at that sutta, if you go all the way back to the beginning, uh, it actually starts off by saying, uh, 
uh, birth is the condition for old age and death. Yeah, this is the beginning. And then it says, and then it goes through all the links, but it's all contracted, so it looks like it's almost all, only saying the last one, but actually all the factors are in there. Yeah. So the definition in this case is that all the 12 factors are what dependent origination is, uh, and it's often defined in this way in the suttas. Uh. But, as we mentioned last time, sometimes you find shorter versions, uh, yeah? And uh, the, the main point of dependent origination is like Venerable Sunya made very explicit last time, is to show the connection between defilements of the mind, craving, uh, rebirth, and suffering. And this is a kind of what you see through, uh, like as a red thread throughout all the suttas that have to do with dependent origination. They must contain at least those three factors uh, to be called dependent origination. Defilements, rebirth, Suffering here. This is kind of the sequence. So. Um, and then we have a question about this is a bit technical diachronic versus synchronic conditionality. I don't know how many people he knows the, these terms. They're, they're not, they're, I remember reading them the first time that was Bikki, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi was writing about the Dhamma. He wrote diachronic and synchronic conditionality, and I had to get out my Oxford English Dictionary to figure out what this meant because I had no idea. But um, so, and this is kind of the problem with having people with PhDs uh, translating the suttas. Uh, <laughs> so I, I looked it up, and you, you find out that uh, uh, diachronic means like e extended in time, yeah? temporal conditionality. So you have like birth being the condition for death. Yeah? That is diachronic because it extends over time. Synchronic conditionality means that you condition each other at the same time, they are there at the same time, they support each other in the present moment, like vinyana, consciousness, and uh, the other aspects of personality, name and form, they are, it's a synchronic conditionality, yeah? And there is a difference here, because sometimes in the suttas they talk about, you know, what are the conditions for the body to exist? Yeah, you need food, if you don't get food, then you die. If you don't get water, you die. If you don't get coffee, or well, you don't die, but almost. Uh, so. <laughs> So you have all of these things, and you, and so this, this is what they, so this is kind of more like um, short term. I'm not sure if it is really di synchronic conditionality, but it's more like a short term conditionality. And sometimes the suttas make this distinction between short term conditionality within one life, uh, and then the more extended conditionality, which goes over many lifetimes. Uh, and that is a valid distinction. So not everything is dependent origination. These things which all apply within one life, yeah, the fact that you eat now and that sustains your body, that's not dependent origination. It is conditionality, but it's not dependent origination. Dependent origination has to have the factors, defilement, rebirth, and suffering. Only then can it be called that. Yeah. But, so that but some of the links are like uh, synchronic in, depend, in the standard 12 yeah. sequence of dependent origination. Yeah, exactly. And that's why you cannot really take out few links and call that dependent origination, need to kind of see them in, you know, in context. So it's true, so there is some part of it, uh, but um, that in itself is not sufficient to call it dependent origination. Uh. Um, okay, then we have a question from uh, about um, dependent origination and how to give up, because the, it says in the Maha, in the um, Dhamma Chakka Pavatana Sutta, it says that the noble truth of the origin of suffering should be given up, yeah? And of course, not really the noble truth, but the origin of suffering should be given up. Yeah? And uh, the or origin of suffering is craving, yeah? So uh, that is the problem, so that should be given up. This is what it says in the, according to the uh, suttas. And, and the question really is, how does this relate the idea of dependent origination. How do we approach this from the idea of dependent origination? And uh, we're going to talk about this later on, but the way that we approach this is that uh, uh, craving can only, this is a very important point we come back to, but craving can only be given up not by restraining the craving, by saying, I won't crave. Yeah, that's not enough. Uh, that will help a little bit. So if you are mindful and you restrain the craving, that, that will help. Uh, but craving can only be given up through insight. And this is what dependent origination teaches us. And that's why dependent origination is so useful. Because instead of stopping at craving being the condition for rebirth, it takes it back. Yeah, what is the condition for craving? Feeling. And it takes it back all the way to ignorance or delusion at the beginning. Yeah? And that is kind of the root cause. And that is 
very helpful because then it shows us what it is that we need to do to overcome this, how to get rid of it, how to uh, give up craving. Yeah? It is given up through a deeper a kind of deeper investigation. And that's how it actually is given up. Uh, and this is why dependent origination, one of the reasons why it is so very useful, uh, because it uh, makes it much more clear how to approach this problem. Uh. Okay. So um, I think we'll stop there actually. Uh. Stop working? Yes, it is. There it is. Okay. okay this is bad news. We're only, which slide is this? Number seven. Whoa. Whoa. Okay. Quick. So um, let's move on because um, these things always take more time than you think. Oh, okay. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. So this, this was the first argument against the first myth. Yeah. <laughs> So we come to the first argument against the first myth, and now we're going to move on to argument B. So the, remember, the myth, the myth that we are looking at here is that dependent origination is all about one lifetime. Um, so this is the second argument. And this is in the suttas, you often find that uh, you find real life applications of dependent origination, yeah? where the Buddha talks about what actually happens to a being as they, you know, as they exist, and how dependent origination happens to that being. Yeah. And this is a classic example of what you find in the Sutta. This is from the uh, famous Sutta, the Maha Nidana Sangyutta, you see DN15 at the bottom there, that is a reference to the Suttas. So I always give reference so people can look them up if they wish later on. And it says here that if consciousness this did not move into the mother's womb, would name and form take shape there, name and form here being the other aspects of personality apart from the consciousness. Yeah, so uh, this is, again, very, to my mind, very clear that we're do, dealing with rebirth, consciousness coming from a pre-existing somewhere, moving into the mother's womb, and then having the development of the fetus as a consequence of that. Yeah. And here we have another example of this. And this is from a sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya. Uh, and uh, mendicants, when three things come together, an embryo moves in. This kind of idea of moving in. Or Kanti in Pali has this idea of embryo. It doesn't just arise there, but it actually something also moves in. Um, it's actually found in the uh, in uh, together with birth and rebirth in other contexts. Uh, what are these three things? Uh, the mother and father coming together. Uh, the mother is in the fertile part of her menstrual cycle. Uh, and then the last one, which is the interesting one here, the spirit being reborn is present. Uh, yeah, this is called the Gandaba in, uh, in Pali. Uh, uh, then the embryo is conceived. Uh, so these are the Practical examples are fairly clear. There's not that many practical examples in the suttas, but uh, I think the message here is fairly, fairly obvious. Uh, you want to add anything? Well, practical from not from a meditation point of view, because yeah, yeah you, it sounds like if you want to end rebirth, just end the mother and father coming together. <laughs> yeah. But that's not what you meant by practical. You meant like a Real practical life. example yeah. of the underlying principle, not, not like practical in the way of us applying the teachings. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so that is uh, reason B, yeah? Pretty good reasons here. Would you agree the good reasons? Uh, yeah? If you don't agree, then we can discuss it later on. Uh, reason number C, yeah, coming up now. Arahants are conscious. Mm. That's a pretty good reason, isn't it? Yeah. So why does this matter? You may think that this seems like a strange reason to bring up, but arahants are conscious. But the reason why this matters uh, is that uh, it follows from dependent origination. If it is all within one life or it is momentary, 
then the moment you get enlightened, uh, you will become unconscious. Uh, and that follows some dependent origination. But we know that arahants are conscious. Arahants here meaning fully awakened beings, yeah, fully enlightened beings. Uh, we know that's the case, so that must mean that dependent origination actually is over, goes over many life, lives, lifetimes. So. Yes, this is the standard uh, sequence of dependent origination that we have seen before. Uh, uh, from ignorance, you have the willed actions. Uh, you act upon those wills, uh, that will, and then you have consciousness. Yeah? So consciousness arises from those willed actions. Uh, uh, but one of the things we haven't really said yet, which is a very important part of uh, dependent origination, we haven't really focused on this, but we should have, uh, is that dependent origination is not just an origination of things, uh, but it's also a cessation sequence. Uh, so if you remove the very first factor, which is ignorance, uh, uh, if you make ignorance come to an end, so it's no longer there, it follows that all of the steps afterwards, they also end. So you, kind of, you have dependent origination, and then you have dependent cessation. Yeah? One is the origination sequence, everything comes into being, especially suffering. Uh, but then you have the cessation sequence, where everything ceases, and then suffering ceases at the end. Uh, so Now, say that we end ignorance. Well, well, what does that mean? Well, ending ignorance means that you become awakened. Yeah? You reach awakening. When you reach awakening, then the Consequence of that is that you end the willed activities, and they come to an end, and that then leads to the end of consciousness. So, the consequence of dependent cessation is that if everything happens within one life, or it happens within momentary, it means that consciousness has to cease in that life, and the arahant becomes unconscious. But are arahants unconscious? Not according to the suttas, yeah? Arahants, they walk around, the Buddha, he talks to you, yeah? And uh, so do all the other Arahants. Uh, and sometimes you need, may need meet monks, maybe nuns, or even certainly monks and nuns, who are, maybe you think they're Arahants in the present day. They're not unconscious, right? Uh, they are there, you, can, you know that they're not unconscious. So, it is obviously, it doesn't work like this. And the only way you can really explain this is that consciousness uh, ends, but it happens at the moment you die, not in this life. In other words, it has to do with rebirth, or in this case, no rebirth, yeah? that this actually is the case. Again, it's a very, I think, a very persuasive argument that uh, uh, dependent origination must be more than a single lifetime. Yeah? Okay. Let's move on. You want to do this one? Well, yeah, we sort of treated this before, I think, uh, in the last week, when we looked at the second and third noble truth in detail. We saw there that uh, it says in the second noble truth that the craving that leads to uh, puna bhava, puna bhava means something like again uh, alive or rebirth is often translated. Uh, that craving that leads to rebirth, that is the cause of suffering. And that is the craving that we see in the origination sequence as well. I think that's the point we were trying to make with this slide, that because the second and third noble truth are about rebirth, and they explain dependent origination, therefore dependent origination is also about rebirth. Uh, yeah. 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 So I've sort of explained that uh, last week in much more detail. But I think it's useful to say as well that uh, this is actually explicit in the suttas. Yeah, the suttas say specifically that the second noble truth uh, uh, can be understood as dependent origination. Yeah? So dependent origination is actually an explanation of the second noble truth. Uh, so instead of craving leads to rebirth, you have all the 12 links. Ah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's actually there. It's, if you want to look it up, it's in the... Uh, Anguttara Nikaya, the, the three is number 60, Sutta 61. I haven't put the reference in here. Oh. Yeah, so just to clarify, there is a Sutta that says, so what is the uh, truth of the origin of suffering? And then uh, what follows is not the usual explanation, but it's actually the sequence of dependent origination. That's how the noble truth is explicitly explained there. And yeah. the third noble truth, what is the noble truth of the cessation of suffering? And the answer is the whole cessation sequence of uh, the, of dependent cessation, yeah. those 12 factors. Yeah. 
How do I? What happened? How, how do I um, edit this slide? Can I do that now, or should I not do that now? No, don't, don't edit it now. <laughs> okay. I wanted to give people a nice, nice view. Okay. So that is that one. That one, uh, and we move on to uh, exhibit E. Yeah, this is like the criminal law case. Uh, we're going to prove uh, <laughs> prove this. Uh, exhibit E is the following: is that uh, when you read the suttas about dependent origination, and there's quite a lot of suttas. The, if you go to the um, connected discourses of the Buddha, there is about maybe 75 suttas. They're all on dependent origination. There are some other important suttas in the Majjhima Nikaya. The most important one is the uh, Majjhima Nikaya, the middle length sayings, number 38. It's known as the greater sutta on the, on the ending of craving, uh, Maha Tanha Kaya Sutta, Sankaya, Sankaya Sutta. And uh, you have the one in the uh, Diga Nikaya, the long discourses, uh, Maha Nidana Sutta, the great sutta on, on causation, or actually, we don't like causation conditionality. And then you have a, a sutta. Uh, this sutta I mentioned before from the numerical discourses. There's quite a lot of suttas. And one of the things that you notice as you read the suttas is that the vocabulary of rebirth is always used in connection with dependent origination. Yeah? The vocabulary is there. I will give you some examples. So, um, yeah, so this is uh, one. You can see this is from the uh, Sangyutta Nikaya over here. Um, Yay, my arrow. Okay, so this is the Sangyutta Nikaya. That this is the connected discourses of the Buddha. And the 12 here, that is the chapter number. This is the uh, uh, sutta's collection on uh, conditionality or causation. And this is sutta number 19. That's how this reference system works. And uh, so when the body breaks up, uh, you go to another body. Yeah, this is in connection with dependent origination, with the explanation of the links. So it must refer to many lives, not a single life. That's the conclusion, really, there. Yeah. Go to the next one. When that consciousness has become established and come to growth, uh, there is renewed existence in the future. Yeah? Again, this is again exactly the same collection. You see there, Sangyutta Nikaya 12, yeah? the collection on uh, discourses relating to dependent origination. So again, the same idea again. Uh, And then you have the idea of consciousness moving in, vinyana, vinyana okanti, I think it is, the idea that consciousness gets established in a new life, yeah, moving into the mother's womb or something like that. And this is a very common usage. You find it in a number of places in the uh, suttas on dependent origination. Yeah? So uh, the whole vocabulary around this is a vocabulary used with rebirth. Uh, and uh, so the more you read of the suttas, the more overview you have of what actually is there, the more you see these trends, these uh, general ways of explaining this. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, again, yeah, there's so many suttas that we could have quoted here, but yeah, just a few examples. And it, we'll only... The point we're trying to get across will, will only really make sense when you start reading the suttas for yourself and you see how many suttas talk about these kind of concepts, especially when you start linking words together and you see the connections. Like when you read here, consciousness moves in. It's, it sounds it's a bit awkward when, when you read in other suttas that this word used for moving in is used as a synonym for rebirth then it becomes clear what is meant by these kind of quotes. Mm. So for us, we have read the suttas, all of them probably multiple times, and we see more of these little connections, but we, we're trying to inspire you also to read the suttas, mm. not just to get the information that is in the suttas, but the Buddha taught all these things in different ways for a reason, because uh, some of the suttas may resonate with some of you, other suttas maybe not, but those suttas may resonate with the other person. So uh, if you read suttas for yourself, you may suddenly come across a sutta that we haven't talked about, but that really inspires you or that really gives you some sort of uh, an urgency for to practice the, uh, the path. Because 
the Buddha thought so much about rebirth leading to suffering, not just to say, okay, rebirth leads to suffering, period. Also, to inspire us to practice and reduce the suffering and then eventually, hopefully, uh, end it all by ending the, the rebirth process. So, I hope to, uh, that we can inspire you to do those kind of things, read suttas and practice, and not just not just listen to us, but listen to the Buddha, basically. That's what, I, what would be cool. Yeah. yeah. And uh, w one of the things that I also like about the idea of rebirth is that it is actually expressed using a, a large number of different terms. Uh, you know, in the suttas, mm -hmm. you have jati, you have sanjati, sanjati you have uh, uh, punabhava, uh, yeah? you have uh, abhinibhati, uh, you have yeah. okanti. Upapatati. Upapajati, yeah, exactly. So you have a large number, and all of these terms are used, yeah? So it's not like there is doubt about one word, and one word might be interpreted in a different way. There's all of these terms all pointing in the same way, and they all really come back to the idea of rebirth. Uh, and, uh, yeah. <clears throat> okay, let's go on to the next one. This is Exhibit F. Number six, <laughs> yeah. It's only number six so far, so we so let's see what happens. Uh, we should have worn our judges' wigs, you know, like the, when they bring exhibits in court. Yeah. And then there's the judge who has the we wig. Should, we should have uh, exactly. That's, that's a good point, actually. Yeah. Next time. It would be cool. Next, Finally, yeah. have hair again. <laughs> yeah. Okay. This is number uh, F. So uh, dependent origination has rebirth in all schools of Buddhism. Yeah. There's not. This is not one of. This is not one of those controversial things. Uh, there are certain things in Buddhism that have been very controversial over the centuries and millennia, and you can read about some of those controversies if you're interested in a book called the Katavattu. Katavattu means something like the basis of discussion or something like that. It's one of the seven books of the Abhidhamma, and it's all about the ancient discussions that they had in Buddhism when the schools started to separate. Yeah? So you have the Theravadan versus the Sarvastivadans, you have the Theravadans versus the Mahasangika school, you have the Theravadans versus, and, and all of these different views are kind of thrashed out, and whether they are, you know, what is a, a orthodox, yeah? what, what is the real word of the Buddha or not. Uh, uh, but one of the things that is not discussed in there uh, is the idea that rebirth somehow refers to one life versus many life, uh, lives. Uh, the idea is like intermediate state uh, is talked about there in the Katavattu. Uh, uh, the idea that uh, uh, Dhammas have an inherent existence, which was like the view of the Sarvastivadan school. These things are very important in there. I, I'm not going to go into detail if you don't know what I'm talking about because it doesn't matter. But uh, rebirth is not really discussed in that book. There does not seem to have been any disagreement in those ancient schools about what uh, uh, about dependent origination in this sense. Uh, also, in the modern area, if you go to Mahayana Buddhism or Tibetan Buddhism or Theravada, or you don't really find any differences in this idea. Dependent origination is always about rebirth idea. Yeah, it's a cross-the-board kind of a, a idea that is used. Um, the very most Disagreement you can find is this one thing from the Abhidhamma that I mentioned last time, but from my personal uh, reading of it, that too is not really about anything apart from rebirth, as far as I can see. That is sometimes interpreted in a slightly different way. Yeah. So again, yeah, it's a very solid, uh, solid thing in Buddhism. What did, what did you do? Yeah, you have to move it to the right. Ah, that's what you said. Okay, thank you. Okay, so then we have the idea of rebirth in the commentaries. And again, uh, if you read the commentaries of uh, uh, Theravada school, the Pali commentaries, these are the ones that explain the content of the sutta according to that tradition of the commentaries. Uh, and one of the most important of all the commentaries is known as the Visuddhi Magga, the path to purification, or the path of purification, depending how you translate that. Uh, and uh, that, that is kind of the core commentary, because all the other commentaries, they refer to, to the Visuddhimagga when they talk about things. Uh, and again, uh, there is no uh, basis for thinking that uh, dependent origination is about many lifetimes in these commentaries. Yeah, they all point in that same direction. Uh, 
So again, they can see how everything in Buddhism, yeah, it comes back to this idea. There isn't really much room for uh, any alternative interpretations. So. Um, then we have another argument. This is the idea that when uh, the, those people who like the idea of a single lifetime, uh, they don't even agree on what that means. Uh, yeah? So some people talk about single lifetime, they talk about momentary things, one thing going from moment to moment. Uh, other people say dependent origination is a, what they call a structural principle. Uh, in other words, it kind of the 12 links, they are there all together at the same time. Yeah? So when you have ignorance, everything else is there by, by default because ignorance is present. It's like a structure. It doesn't really, uh, it's not, not so much a temporal thing moving forward in time, uh, but it's more like a structure that is always present. Yeah? And then there are those people who uh, say that it all happens within one life, but not all of it is momentary. Yeah? It may happen over, over a period of time as well. Yeah? And so there, there is no agreement about those people who talk about a single life. And the reason why there is no agreement, I think, is because you don't really have a, a basis that you can go back to and refer to. Yeah? There isn't anything in the suttas that you can say, well, this is the meaning of dependent origination to support your argument. Because you are starting out, uh, because you are adding to what is in the suttas, it becomes more building up your own theory, and that's why it diverges so much. Uh, so I think this is another uh, uh, significant argument. So having said all of these things, uh, I hope you are. Are you thoroughly convinced? If you're not thoroughly convinced yet, uh, I have one final argument, yeah? And this is the argument above all arguments. Uh, and I've left it to last, uh, just to kind of any doubters uh, in the room, they will, uh, if you don't agree with this last one, then, then I don't know what to say. Then there's nothing more to be said. Then we are kind of coming to the end of what can be said. Yeah? <laughs> this is the very last one. And this is the definition of jati in the sutta. As jati means birth, or as Ajahn Sujato translates it, rebirth. I really like the idea of translating jati as rebirth because uh, uh, in Ancient India, or in the uh, context of the suttas, any, when, if you have birth, that also is rebirth. Yeah? And this is a very interesting point of translation. Uh, if we translate jati as birth into English, uh, our idea of what birth is is very different from the ancient idea of the ancient Indians. Uh, we don't have any idea that it means rebirth. Yeah? But for the ancient Indians, uh, and for many people perhaps today, even today in Buddhist countries, uh, you hear the word birth, you know actually it means rebirth. The word jati actually has that connotation with it. So I think it is uh, very advisable the way Adan Sudrato does this, to actually translate jati as rebirth, because that is what those people would have heard when they heard the word birth. But uh, regardless, yeah, let's look at the definition anyway. The definition is what matters here. And the definition is the rebirth, inception, conception, reincarnation, manifestation of the aggregates, the acquisition of the sense fields of the various sentient beings in the various orders of sentient beings. Yeah? And uh, if you look at that, yeah, the manifestation of the personality factors, yeah, coming into the acquisition of the sense faculties, you become aware of the world around you, uh, all of these words here are words you find throughout the suttas in this particular context. And the last part there is perhaps the most important one, uh, you know, where it says that uh, the various kinds of beings into the various orders of sentient beings. Uh, you know, the words you arise in that order, you become human, yeah? You become a bird, you become a ghost, yeah? If you haven't done the right thing, you become a ghost. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is how it then works. And this is then. The second part there makes that very clear. Rebirth of sentient beings into the various realms. Gods being reborn as gods. Fairies being <laughs> reborn as fairies. Uh, spirits being reborn as spirits. Creatures being reborn as creatures. Hum humans being reborn as humans. Quadrupeds. <laughs> quadrupeds. That's okay. Quadrupeds being reborn as quadrupeds. Bipeds. That's another word for birds. Bipeds. 
two-seated two creatures, by birds being reborn as birds, or reptiles being reborn as reptiles, each into their own realm. Yeah? We're talking about rebirth here in the ordinary sense. It is not a metaphor for the arising of mental states. It is a, you know, what actually happens to beings when they arise in, an, in a particular realm. So is that, what do you think? Is that argument persuasive? Is that, that kind of... Uh, <laughs> anyway, to me, it's very persuasive, but of course, there's always going to be uh, disagreement about, about such things. So. And Mr. Nuo, do you want to add anything to that? No, I'm happy. You're happy? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, so because, what... Yeah, yeah. To me, if I read these kind of things, it's very clear <laughs> what jati is about. I sometimes wonder why people redefine it because this is really the, the, the thing that happens when people see dependent origination as a one lifetime thing. They redefine these terms in a way that suits their ideas really. And again, those ideas may be helpful to some extent, but if you want to understand what the Buddha taught, then it makes more sense to go back to the Buddha's definition of certain terms, right? So people may define jati as the birth of a mind state or whatever, the birth of a sense of self, but that Buddha doesn't talk about jati in that way at all, never in the suttas anywhere. It's, it's always things like this, uh, the rebirth as a human or rebirth uh, as, as an animal or whatever, and not as a rebirth of a mind state. So, uh, yeah. And this is just an example of jati there's also other terms that are very clearly defined by the Buddha, like old age and death. It almost doesn't need a definition to me anyway. Old age and death, isn't it clear what that means? Just by the words themselves. But the Buddha knew that this was difficult to understand this Dhamma and that people were going to misinterpret it. So he was very clever and also even defined old age and death uh, in in very clear terms, like passing away, dying, uh, uh, or kicking the bucket. No, he didn't say that, but, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I can't remember the exact terms, but it goes on, similar to this, all making it very clear what death actually means to the Buddha. And then other peoples have their other interpretations that mean death is death of the sense of self or a mind state or whatever. I'm not familiar with those interpretations uh, very much for this very reason that I started reading the suttas it was clear to me what these kind of terms mean and then I see somebody interpret it very differently uh, I feel a disconnect between that and the Buddha and I am most inspired by the Buddha uh, therefore I prefer to interpret things the way the Buddha did Again, I'm, I've said it many times before, but this is not to say that some of those ideas can't be helpful in some way, like it, the arising of a sort of sense of self in certain contexts. You, you, you can contemplate that uh, as sort of a birth, but it's not, not the way the Buddha uh, explained things. And that if you interpret things different from the Buddha, then it can be a bit, become dangerous because you move away from the best teacher that we uh, have. And I think we're sort of rounding, rounding up this myth now, right? About... Uh, Almost, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I just wanted to add, the, I like the uh, definition in the suit as of old age. I think it's really, it's really graphic, yeah. So it says about old age, it's the graying of the hair, yeah, that graying of the hair, and the, and the, and the wrinkling of the skin, yeah, the, break, the brokenness of the teeth, the blotching of the limbs, yeah, that we get when we get older. The kind of being bent over, I think it says like a roof, bent over like a roof bracket, you're walking along here like this. And there's a very graphic explanation of old age, and there's no doubt that this refers to the body, not to a mind state. The mind state doesn't have broken teeth, yeah, that kind of stuff. So I think it's, that's, 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 yeah, I, I really like, I, it's just so graphic and clear. And uh, when you see that, you realize all of these, all of these words, they all come together in one package, birth, old age, and death. They obviously refer to what happens to beings in the realms of existence. So, uh, yeah, that's an important point. Uh, um, yeah, there was something else I was going to say, but bing, gone. Okay. 
Um, let's uh, have a short meditation again and then come back to some questions. Yeah.
Okay, let's, uh, let's carry on. Huh? <coughs> so, uh, again, time is going fast, so would you, does anyone like to ask any more questions or comments on what's going on? Huh? Nicholas, please, fire away. A good, I think that's a good point, actually, that you, when you think about birth, we normally think about the physical birth, like you have in the animal realm and the, and the human realm, and that actually birth, according to the suttas, of, very often just means the arising in a realm, it's like, bing, and you're there. Yeah? And bing is different from ordinary rebirth, there's a different kind of rebirth. There. So I think that's a, that's a good point. So maybe we could, I think, reformation of the aggregates might be slightly too... Uh, I'm not sure if, I, if, if that might be too kind of people would probably get lost and we would put aside the, the, the sutta straight away if they saw that. They might wonder what on earth is going on. But some other way of, of saying that, you know, things coming into existence in a new life, maybe, yeah, I, I see your point. It's a good point, yeah. I thought, oh? I, thought, <laughs> I thought of the idea of maybe... Um, new life or something like this because um, you know at least a new life can happen in any realm mm. so it was just one, one alternative that I had sort of reflected on yeah new life yeah okay but yeah I yeah, appreciate we're looking forward to the Nicholas translation yeah. mm. we, get, we get one of these you know <laughs> anyway, thank you Ajahn so, yeah great You mentioned earlier about, um, and in this workshop and the last one, but very briefly, that you don't like causality, you prefer conditionality. Why are you making that distinction? I don't think you explained. We will explain that uh, in much more detail later today. So we'll come, we'll spend an hour or more on your question alone. Bhante. <laughs> <laughs> um, Can I make a question? Where are you? I'm here. Oh, the back there. Okay. <laughs> okay. Hi, oh, Gabriel. Hi. Hi. Uh, so, um, just to a consideration on exactly what you were saying about how well spelled out rebirth is, is that for a few centuries all this was transmitted orally. So, if they could have saved time by shortening it, they would. But they, they did not. They yeah. decided to not do it. And as well, even when they start writing, they will be writing it every few generations in, in a piece of paper that would just be destroyed by humidity and so on in, in Southeast Asia. So it's just one consideration about the relevance of us finding it so clearly and in so many words yeah. spelled out. And another question I have for you, Bhante, is when I read the Majjhima Nikaya 38, uh, what is that Sati got so wrong? Because when you presented um, some quotes about the consciousness being uh, installed or finding a way into a new birth, mm. it's, it's quite similar, not necessarily the same, as what Sati says in Majima 38. And the Buddha says, no, you're very wrong. So I just want to understand what he get wrong, but from the perspective of dependent origination. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to make it a whole exposition of Majima yeah. 38, which is yeah. the crux of it. What did he get wrong then in yeah, that sure. case? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, well, thank you for the, the, the first point, I think, is a very, is a good one. You know, they... Uh, instead of making it as short as possible as using one word, they make all these synonyms uh, and they kind of explain it over and over again. Uh, 
And, I, and obviously the reason for that is because the Buddha would have known how easy these things get confused. Uh, yeah? We all, because we come from a deluded perspective, in fact, not just delusion, but illusion, we see things that are not actually there. Yeah, this is the problem. We see things that are not really there. We see a self when there is no self. There will always be a very powerful tendency to distort the teachings uh, because that delusion that we have, the illusion we have, will tend to drag the teaching to align themselves with the illusion. Uh, yeah? The illusion is so powerful and so strong. Yeah? So the only way to counteract that is to make the teaching as crystal clear as you possibly can. And I think this is why we see the large amount of repetition, the large amount of use of synonyms in the suttas, uh, the various angles, the same teaching is often given from a large number of different angles. Uh, yeah? And this is how you create that um, uh, st stability in the Dhamma, and it's not so easily distorted. It still gets distorted, yeah? <laughs> this is the funny thing, but actually there's less chance of doing it. Uh, so that's a good point. From a po point perspective, or oral perspective, you think, uh, from a perspective of oral um, recitation, you would like to have only one word, make it as short as possible, so you get it out over and done with. Yeah, but uh, so. And the second point about the the sati, the fisherman, we come back to that later on when we talk about the mutual conditionality between consciousness and uh, nama rupa, name and form. Uh, but the short answer is that uh, it looks like sati considered uh, consciousness to be a thing, yeah, a thing which is solid. Uh, which is always there, which doesn't change. There's an underlying awareness that you always carry with you, uh, and that is kind of uh, is permanent, basically. Uh, and he does, didn't see consciousness itself as granular, uh, you know, having being lasting for a certain amount of time and then moving between the senses. And every time consciousness moves, actually, it is a different type of consciousness. Uh, there is no underlying unity to even awareness and consciousness. Uh, so there is consciousness is always there, and consciousness re arises in a future life, but uh, the idea is to think of it as a stream, a stream of granular, discrete events, rather than a continuous thing which always is there, underlying experience. Uh, and once you kind of get into that idea, then you kind of understand what is going on. And, you know, if you think about your experience uh, yeah, in life, I think the kind of the idea of something which is uh, not continuous it actually makes, in many ways, more sense. Uh, Although awareness, it's, awareness is, is a tricky one. It's very easy to see awareness as continuous. But uh, I think yeah, you start to get the idea once you start to investigate your, your experience. Uh, yeah. But we'll come back to that, uh, Gabriel, because it's a bit too, yeah, too short. Some questions from the <coughs> internet from Indira Fernando. Venerables, if I remember correctly, if you take the Buddha's explanation of dependent origination in the Nidana Sutta, isn't it obvious that it's about rebirth? Yeah, obvious to you and obvious to us as well, but apparently not obvious to ev everybody. And many Buddhists who are very knowledgeable of the suttas, apparently it's still not obvious to them that dependent origination is about rebirth and they interpret it in some way without rebirth. So that's sort of what we're trying to address here. So. And a question from Henry Wang that I read before, but I don't understand actually. So maybe Henry Wang, if you can rephrase your question, if you hear this, that would be uh, would be nice. Uh, and, a, and a comment from Daniel Wellard: Once a process reaches a certain stage, it can't re regress. It says that somewhere. Uh, I don't know where that somewhere is. Uh, so it is possible to regress. Just make, sh just make sure in this life that you reach the stage where you won't regress back. I think Daniel is uh, encouraging everybody to practice the Dhamma and see dependent origination. And, uh, so you reach a point where you don't fall back into the uh, lower realms. Because when you see dependent origination, you understand the process of rebirth. You also understand that this process happens without a soul or an essence inside of it. It happens as part of nature. And when you understand that, you understand it to such an extent that that process gets weakened, let's say, uh, so that it is impossible for that person who sees, uh, who sees this to be reborn back into uh, 
uh, lower realms. The lowest rebirth they could take would be as a human being. They call these people stream winners and uh, hopefully you all understand this someday but we'll explain about this uh, more probably in a, another class as well. Yeah. Ooh, right. uh, before you go on, let's just give one, someone else a chance as well. Yeah, so maybe Venerable over there. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. We missed the last um, session but Many of us watch it on video, so I hope it's okay to ask a question that kind of comes a little bit from there, but also touches on what you said today. I just wasn't sure that I, I accurately understood the point you were trying to make about the Abhidhamma. Um, I mean, I myself, probably because I've been conditioned by you and Ajahn Brahm, haven't actually uh, read very much Abhidhamma in great depth, so I, I can't really tell from my own um, understanding of it, but it seemed to me you were saying that the Abhidhamma texts themselves uh, don't actually interpret, come, arrive at this idea of one life, that it's just more like a reframing rather than um, calling it rebirth of uh, a being, but more in terms of the five kandas. But still that there is the idea of rebirth across lifetimes uh, in the way that Abhidhamma presents it. Um, not just in their summary of how the suttas present it, but in the way that they present it from their point of view. So I just wanted to clarify, is that what you meant? That, that actually if, I mean, it wasn't in your list of exhibits. It was like, okay, well, all the, all the schools had rebirth and the commentaries had rebirth. But one of your exhibits wasn't that the Abhinama has rebirth. So I'm just wondering, um, yeah, if you could restate what you meant about that. And also, if it is the case that the Abhinama does have uh, the understanding of rebirth across lifetimes, then Historically speaking, where does the idea come from of it being a single life? Is it purely a modern uh, sort of riff or a sort of appropriation of the framework of dependent origination to, to use it in this particular way? Okay, yeah. I, yeah, I think basically what, you, uh, what you're saying, the, the idea that you know, instead of talking about the rebirth of beings, you want to talk about the rebirth of... Uh, of um, dhammas, which are kind of the, you know, the basic building blocks of reality according to the Abhidhamma. So you take it more into a philosophical way and you look at things from what the Abhidhamma considered more ultimate perspective. Beings don't exist, but dhammas exist. Yeah, these are, you could argue, the five khandas, for example, even though the Abhidhamma dissolves it even more than that. So the Abhidhamma would say that these are the things that get reborn rather than a being. It's just the five aggregates carrying on. It's not really a being because there's no, there's no being there. It's just these things carrying on. And, uh, of course, the word Dhamma in itself, uh, you know, the, whole, the way it is explained there, the whole 12 links are actually redefined to, to some extent. Uh, but the, 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 the way the words they use for uh, these Dhammas being reborn are almost exactly the same words they use for the being being reborn. Uh, the only difference is that they take the word Satta, which means being, and exchange to put Dhamma in, the, in its place. Uh, but the words used are Jati, Sanjati, uh, yeah, Abhinibhati, Okanti, and these are all exactly the same words used for the rebirth of a being. If, if it really meant a rising of qualities moment to moment, you would expect it to use words that actually mean that. And in the suttas you have words like Samudaya, which means things arising in the present life, yeah? or Udaya, or uh, 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 even uh, Upajati, which can mean the rising of things here and now. But it doesn't actually use that. It still uses the words uh, that are related to the rebirth in the Abhidhamma itself. Uh, so for me, that doesn't seem to be much basis there for arguing that they are looking at this thing in an entirely new way. They are moving away from what they call a conventional reality to more absolute reality. That's what I think they're doing, because that is what the whole Abhidhamma is about. It's about moving towards a more absolute perspective. Uh, yeah? dividing the world of atomizing the being into, into atoms, yeah, the dhammas and the, all the constituent factors, and then dividing time into the most tiny time bits and all of that kind of uh, idea. So this is a, one part of the question. But the other part of the question, which I think is very important, and you may, you, you probably caught that already, but is that the Abhidhamma itself makes a distinction between what is the explanation of the suttas, the suttanta bhajaniya, and the Abhidhamma bhajaniya explanation according to the Abhidhamma. And in the explanation according to the suttas, it uses exactly the same words as you find in the suttas. So it would agree, even if Dhamma has a slightly different meaning, it, would, it, it seems to be saying this is a new 
way of looking at it. Uh, it is, you shouldn't apply this to the suttas. Uh, the suttas have one way. This is our way. This is a new one. Uh, so when you read the word of the Buddha, it still means rebirth in all contexts, but we can come up with a new way of using the same ideas. Uh, at the very most, that's what it means. Uh. If it's using vocabulary of dhammas, it's still in, in the context of rebirth across lifetimes. Is that I'll, correct? That's what it looks in, like to in me. The that's what it looks like to me anyway. Yeah, I, I can't see anything else personally, but uh, yeah. Mm, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so then, sorry, the next part of my question. So then, yeah. when you say that modern interpreters of, oh, yeah. of dependent origination, yeah. Yeah. they they use the Abhidhamma as, as sort of evidence, is that correct? You, is that, in your interpretation, that's sort of a misunderstanding of Abhidhamma, but that's, that's the basis from which they argue? I, I, I've seen, I don't know if everyone does that, but I've seen that argument being made, and so I, that's, and I don't know what, what the sequence is, whether they uh, read the Abhidhamma, then came up with this idea, whether they had this idea first, then read the Abhidhamma and said, oh yeah, this supports my argument. Yeah? I mean, we don't know the, the sequence here. You have to kind of look at uh, the history of how these ideas arose. Uh, um, but uh, I think a lot of the people who had these ideas, they, uh, they didn't actually refer to the Abhidhamma. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking about, uh, that there are some, uh, some very, there's only a couple of monks who made these arguments early on, early on uh, who are kind of, uh, uh, yeah, who, um, and I, I don't think they actually refer to the Abhidhamma, but later on the Abhidhamma has maybe been brought in to support that argument. Uh, so the sequence here is also a bit murky and uncertain. Uh, yeah. I think a lot of the reason why they do this is because there are suttas that look like they might be dependent origination, uh, like the uh, Madhupindika Sutta, the Honeyball Sutta, and the Majjhima Nikaya, which gives the sequence of perception leading to Papancha. Yeah? And that is very similar in some ways to dependent origination. And then you think that this is dependent origination, and once you apply that, and you, then you, that's how that argument gets made, I think, yeah, largely. Do you have comments? Well, just to clarify to people, because there may be some people new here to all of this, that Abhidhamma is a teaching that was not given by the Buddha, but arose much later on. So what is said in the Abhidhamma it's really sort of irrelevant for those people who, like me, are interested in what the Buddha said. So when I have never studied the Abhidhamma myself, I don't know much about it. So uh, just to clarify that you also don't really need to. Yeah. Just, just that. Excellent. Shall we... Uh, Ananda, you want to ask your question? Yeah, well, there's time. There's always time for questions. Yeah, no, it was a minor thing I was going yeah. to ask on that uh, last uh, sentence, Ajahn, on uh, uh, 15. Yeah. But that has overshadowed the question on that Mahatanha Sankaya Sutta. But this one I'll ask first. That uh, into their own roams, but it's uh, quadrupeds, birds, and reptiles. They are all animals. So, animal roam, that is one so. Yeah. Is it satanikaya, the word, or the, for that uh, own room? Yeah. Is it satanikaya? The, the, uh, the, the, the uh, sentient beings into the various realms. Ka classes. Satanikaya, yeah. The, Is it the, the classes the, or the rooms? The cl classes of beings, yeah. yeah classes yeah, of yeah, beings. Yeah. That's what I wanted to clarify yeah, yeah. first. Time. But then yeah. that question on the venerable uh, Bikusati's yeah. uh, misconception. Would it be right that he did not see that the consciousness is, uh, what are the words, sankatang, olarikang, yeah. paticca samupanyang? That's, that's part of the argument there, yeah. He, so he, he didn't, uh, yeah, he didn't the see it yeah. Uh, yeah. subject to conditionality yeah. or causality, and he didn't yeah. see that it is yeah. subject to vanishing and uh, yeah. arising and vanishing. Yeah. That, that is why he called him uh, silly man. <laughs> yeah, no, indeed. And that's why he, yeah, so that's why the rest of the sutta is all about dependent origination. Dependent yeah. origination. How consciousness is dependently originated. And yeah. subject to uh, rising and vanishing. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, let's have a break. And we'll see you back again at uh, noon at 12 o'clock. Great.
Chris will probably have very <laughs> similar points as well. So that's our points there, yeah. Origination. And it's when you listen to the explanation of it, it will speak to you in different ways depending on your personal background and experience. And I personally think that that's very much influenced by your sense of self who is doing the listening and then will take a sense of self with your interpretation of the, uh, of the dependent origination. So there can be a lot of ego associated with or a lot of uh, uh, personalisation and owning, intellectual owning associated with uh, looking at the study of this topic. And, and of course anyone who disagrees with one then, um, you know, all, all the things that follow that. Um, yeah, complexity of teachings. Someone here said, someone here said, avidya gives rise to different interpretations. Well, I couldn't agree with that more. Um, but avidya is not a light switch like it's on or it's off. You know, I've got avidya or I haven't got avidya. It's a, it's a dimmer switch. So there's degrees of avidya. Um, Someone said that there's no scientific proof. Um, yeah, I think we'd have to argue with that unless someone's come back from, <laughs> from a previous life and told us what it was like. Um, but the point was made that there is a consistency in the teachings of the early Buddhist teachings uh, right through uh, all the different schools. So that's an encouraging. Uh, not given that the Dhamma itself can be quite challenging. Some people have a hard time understanding anatta, um, maybe some people can't understand impermanence. Um, but yeah, some parts of the teaching seem to be quite challenging to, to, to various people. Um, so we end up with a whole bunch of different translations. And then we have our own um, conditioning, which has been brought up, I think, by everybody. We've we all come from different places. We have different experiences, different levels of education, etc. That in turn colours our view of the teaching. So, pretty much, we all have a different, a different version, I guess. Um, by this point, we bring our own defilements into it, our own cultural interpretations, our sense of self. Um, they all play a big role in how we um, comprehend the teaching. Then there is our faith in Buddha. How, how much faith do we really have in the real teachings of the Buddha, in living like that real um, Buddhist lifestyle? And um, the sasana, I think it says, Sasana is in decline. Sa right? Sasana. Sasana, yeah. the, the, the dispensation, in other words, the religion or the teaching. Yeah, Sasana. Yeah. Seems to be in decline yeah. somewhat, even in places like Thailand, where you would think they should all be our hands by now, but in fact, it's sort of going <laughs> the other way. Um, and nobody knows who is an Arahant. There seems to be a reluctance to for people to stand up and say, um, this is the, the, the way, here is the way to Nibbana. Um, I mean, look at the group here, it's very small. We come from all over Perth, but there's like a million people that really should be celebrating these teachings, but unfortunately they're not. It's, it's sort of like a little closed community in a way. So, you know, nobody, even here, nobody knows who these days is an Arahant. Who should we be listening to? Yeah. And that pretty much sums up our, our group. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, there are methods who's in your group? Who's, ah, yeah. yeah. Our group came up with the four items there. Number one, uh, because of self, each person's understanding of the of a DO is different. Number two is uh, uh, making an attempt to interpret uh, differently to relate to the present present life. 
Number three, words got uh, different meanings to different persons so because of that different. And number four, not understanding the consciousness clearly. Okay, Ajahn Brahmali, you want to sum up what the groups have just said? <laughs> 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 well, I, th I think there's a few obvious things here. It seems I can probably add to what I say. Um, but the obvious one, which comes, everyone talks about, is your conditioning. Yeah? And, your, and obviously a very big part of the conditioning is delusion. Yeah? And when delusion and conditioning come together, it twists anything. Everything gets twisted, yeah? including the dependent origination, including the entire Dhamma gets twisted, because that delusion tries to align it with the delusion. Yeah? So... Um, one of the, um, you know, I think one of the uh, answers that we're discussing this before about reading the Dhamma and thinking that it's complicated or whatever, when we come to the Dhamma, we should try to our very best of our ability to put aside uh, our predispositions, our existing ideas, uh, and reading the Dhamma afresh, yeah, as if it is something that you have no idea about, as if you f throw everything out and you read, what is the Buddha trying to say? Yeah? Forget about my opinions. What is the Buddha coming to say? And this comes back to the idea of faith that you mentioned before. Yeah, you have, if you have that faith and confidence in the Buddha as your teacher, it's easier to throw out all your ideas and take on board what the Buddha himself says. Uh, I think that's a, a really important point. Uh, so this is the first one. So we have to try to avoid uh, our conditioning. Yeah. And the second thing, which I think is also very, comes out very clearly, is this idea that we often listen to various teachers, various traditions, various interpretations, but it's actually quite rare in the world to go back to the early Buddhist texts and really find out what the Buddha taught. Uh, and when you do that, you find actually it is not that hard. Yeah? We have this idea, it is very complex, but I think what, one of the things that we will hopefully show during this cor <laughs> course is that it's not that hard. Uh, and if it, is, it still looks hard, it's because the teachers are no good. So then you can come back and you can fire us. <laughs> so but yeah, my, our job is to make it comprehensible for everyone. And if we don't do that, I think this is one of the problems. Teachers generally are not good enough. We probably aren't anywhere near as good as we should be. Aye. But we're doing... Oh, okay, I'll speak for myself. I'll speak for myself. <laughs> but it's, it's actually, you know, so you... The presenting the Dhamma is actually hard, and, and uh, so this is part of the problem as well. Teachings aren't down-to-earth enough, practical enough, uh, and workable enough very often. Uh. in the same, uh, same ballpark with what we are thinking. Uh, one thing that's interesting is when the Buddha had his enlightenment experiment, experience and then reflected on it, reflected basically on dependent origination, and then asked himself the question, shall I teach this? And then the first thing, he, his reaction was, well, nobody's going to understand this. <laughs> Luckily, he was wrong about that. If we, have, we believe the suttas, that, that really happened. But it, whether that really happened or not, we can't really know, but it shows you that how hard it is actually to understand these things like from a deeper point of view. It comes down to this delusion which you mentioned before. We can sort of chuck all the reasons into two baskets. One is like the intellectual, historical, uh, thinking kind of ideas which are all different, but on the other hand, we have the uh, things that go beyond words, beyond translations, beyond histor historical context. And that is basically the things that we see without thinking, the things that arise in meditation. And uh, it, seems, it seems rare that people really meditate deeply enough and have the real...
changes. So we don't have to really worry about who are enlightened right now if we have some understanding of what the Buddha taught. Uh, and that's where the early Buddhist texts come in. I just wanted to share from my group that it was a really um, compassionate and sensitive desire to contribute as people were talking. So if they had, they were stuck on one of the particular linkages. Let it reveal itself slowly. Okay, great. Marvelous. Blimmin' marvelous. <laughs> okay. Okay. Anyone else want to say anything? Mm -hmm. Nadi, okay, you're always reliable. <laughs> Ajahn Brahmali, yeah. I agree with you when you said that it is not hard to yeah. understand the thing. Yeah. You see, I, can I share? I have my own way of understanding it, you know. And I can, you know, I can see how there's a lot of, like, uh, how do you say, confusion, you know, at the first glance, okay? Yeah. So the first thing is, we must know that this, uh, from my view, okay, this 12 links, it covers three lifespans, you know. Previous life, this life, and next life, okay? Previous life, we don't know. Next life, we don't know, you know. So if you can look at this life's link, you know. Starting, my, my that's a, the first two is from previous life, okay. The last two, next life. The the this life, the third link from conscious to the te, to the tenth link, you know, like consciousness, the um, what you call the the sixth sense doors, this thing, you know. And then there's a feeling, perception, this thing, you know. And then there's the the the, the contact, you know. And then the grasping, the becoming. You can see it very clearly. This what's happening in this life. And it helps yeah. us too, you know, to, to like cause and effect, you know, <laughs> to, to, to understand our wrongdoing when we suffer, you know, yeah. you know that's the wrongdoing for, for, from there, yeah, and it can be reversed too. You know. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else like to say anything here? Yeah. Oh, what, Chris, over there. Yeah. <coughs> oh, okay. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah, please, you start. Uh, yeah. Lord Buddha said that what he's written, you must find out for yourself with your own knowledge. Yeah. So I'm just wondering what practice do you do to understand dependent origination for yourself, except for conceptually? Okay. Well, we will be talking about that a lot later on because once we get into the, um, uh, the 12 steps, we will show how they can be practiced, how you can relate to them from a practical perspective. Uh, there's a lot in there, starting from avijja at the very beginning. Straight away, when you know that avijja or ignorance is the problem, that tells you something about what you need to do to overcome that. Uh, later, later on in the sequence, we have craving arising from sensation. Yeah, that tells you a little bit about what you have to do, uh, so with how we deal with craving and sensation. Uh, and later on, about the whole idea of, you know, taking up and all of these things. It will, it, that should become clear hopefully later on. Uh, yeah, of course. Bhante, um, I'm a subscriber to point number five on your list over there on the thing. And so I'm wondering uh, whether you'll put me right later on down the, down the track and uh, cure or clear, clarify my ignorance on that point because I've <laughs> always believed that. Yeah, yeah. You're going to do that? Absolutely, that? of course. Great. Yeah, we, we uh, shall, yeah, especially now after you ask that question. Yeah, I yeah, promise. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, Bhante, I just have a theory. Uh, a theory, you really okay. Get, yeah. If you really get dependent origination, you, you pretty much are about to expire, to, to uh, disappear. So we are the ones left behind. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we have so many different views of it. Yeah. That's a good point, isn't it? It's a very good point. So those people who know, they've already gone there. You can't see, meet them because they disappear out of samsara and all the ignorant people are left. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Dukkha! 
Yeah, and that's why we have the EBTs. Yeah, the EBTs is the testament of, a, of one who actually knew, and that's kind of the great thing about having the early Buddhist texts. Uh, but you're right, it's problematic, yeah? And this is why, uh, you know, one of the difficult things I realize for most lay people is that they have limited time when it comes to the suttas. Uh, and this is a kind of, I must admit, for me, one of the great reasons for becoming a monk. You can really immerse yourself in these things and spend almost full time just reading the suttas, uh, except when you do, kind of do stupid other things, which we sometimes we do. But, uh, you know, and this is kind of one of the reasons I would encourage people to become monastics, because it really gives you much more, I think, generally speaking, gives you more confidence in these teachings, because you are more involved with them in a deeper level, uh, and you have a feeling for what it is about. Uh, so... Uh, yeah, but you have, it's a good point. Mr. you want to say anything? I'm happy. You're happy? Yeah. He's happy as well. Okay, happy. good. Yeah. Anything else, sir? Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Good, sir. So let's carry on because it's getting, uh, time is as always, there's always never enough time. That's kind of the, basically the uh, reality of things. Uh, and that's why we die and we're still on the path and we kind of carry on because there was never enough time. Uh, so um, let's move on to the next one. Uh, so can I, if I go there, is that right? Uh, and then I go to there. Yes. Ding. Double click. Ah. All righty. Yeah, okay. So um, I want to have a little bit yeah, so I want to have a little bit more look. This is the myth number two, and it is very closely related to the first one, that dependent origination only relates to a single life, because moment to moment is obviously within one life. Yeah? So it is closely related to that. But it is important because it is a, a um, particular interpretation that you will find quite commonly, and it is based on certain suttas. And I just wanted to show you those suttas so you have an understanding where this comes from and why this problem actually uh, exists. So the idea moment to moment here is that if you think about your perception, how we perceive the world, uh, yeah, you get input through the senses, uh, then you have a reaction to that input, you uh, like it or you dislike it, uh, and then you have desires depending on that like and dislike, uh, yeah? and then you create all this stuff around this, uh, and this is what this perceptual sequence is about, uh, what we're talking about here. And I'll show you how this, is, uh, how this comes out in the suttas. Uh. So we have the uh, traditional interpretation, which is the three lifetime, and then you have the momentary one, which is kind of a, a modern idea, yeah? And uh, so the traditional one looks like this. So this is how the perceptual sequence is sometimes found within dependent origination itself because it is part of dependent origination. It is not in itself dependent origination, but it's part of it. Uh, so you see here how I, the eye, yeah, the ability to see and the external things that you see, eye and sights, they come together and from that you get eye consciousness. Yeah? And then eye consciousness, the three of these things together, that is what we call uh, sense impression, yeah, or contact with the world. In other words, you experience something because of these three coming together. You have an experience. Uh, that is what is meant here by contact. Contact has a sensation or a feeling associated with it. Whenever you have an experience, it feels in a certain way. You like it, you dislike it, or it's neutral. Uh, yeah? And then from that uh, contact and feeling, that is part of dependent origination, as we saw before, so then the whole process carries on from there. Yeah. So then you have the craving, the taking up, the uh, life or existence, and then rebirth and old age and death coming as a consequence of that. Yeah. So this shows you how the perceptual process can be, Im can be input into dependent origination and then lead to all the problems. Uh, yeah? Our perception of the world uh, takes us to drives this thing we call the, the rebirth process uh, and therefore also suffering as a consequence. So uh, this is the traditional way, but then this, is, this here, the next one is then the idea of momentary experience yeah, coming up. And this is taken from another sutta, uh, which is not really about dependent origination. It looks like this. Uh, and you can see the beginning there is exactly the same. Yeah? You have eye insights, then you have eye consciousness, you have contact again, in other words, sense impression, and then you have sensa uh, sensation and feeling. Yeah. 
But then it takes a different course. Yeah? It goes to uh, perception, uh, thinking, and proliferation. And there's one more step after that. Uh, now, so what exactly is going on here? What, what does this mean? Uh, yeah? And what this means, the idea of proliferation here, is one of those uh, words in the Pali language. It's actually the Pali word behind this. It's papancha, proliferation. Uh, and papancha is one of these words that uh, uh, have to do with distorted thinking. Yeah, thinking which is rooted in defilements, rooted in delusion, rooted in a sense of ego and a sense of self. And for example, ideas such as I am or I am this or craving or views and all of these kind of things, these are aspects of papancha, all the distortions that we have in our mind. So what this does, this particular sequence does, it shows us how through the arising, through, the percept through perception, yeah, through the uh, sense input, uh, it leads to distortion, and it leads to distortion because uh, we are uh, root de delusion is already there, avidja ignorance is already there. So then, the whole process of uh, experience in the world is also deluded, and we add things to experience which actually don't exist. Uh, yeah, if you add an I am, you I'm add an I am this, uh, and then you crave because of that, and you have views because of that, and all of this is added. It comes on top of the raw experience, which just is the input of external things. So this is a very interesting one. And we were talking last time we were here about how through in meditation we can sometimes see yeah, how your ego comes into existence or how the ego is reinforced. And this is part of this process here, yeah? how the ego kind of gets built up through the process of perception in the world in this particular way. Yeah? How craving gets built up in this way, how our views get built up, our conceit, the conceit I am, yeah? and all of these things that are delusions, they are built up through this process. But, and this is the important point, although this is a very interesting teaching, and all, although uh, you will be able to see this in your meditation. Once you calm down, you will see the connection between your thinking mind and your perceptions and how that feeds into your ego. You should be able to see that to some extent. Uh, what you will notice, it lacks those factors uh, that we talked about last time, especially when Abhisunya went through this in great detail, uh, uh, that actually make it dependent origination. Yeah? So what you find here, you find the... Uh, uh, you find proliferation. Proliferation is an aspect of delusion so, or defilement. So the defilement aspect is there. But what is missing is rebirth. And what is missing is suffering. Yeah? So you're missing two out of three things that are required to make something into dependent origination proper. So although this can be put into dependent origination, yeah? although it can be form an aspect of it, it needs more to actually become dependent origination. You need to add rebirth, and you also have to add dukkha for this to work out. And this is actually quite important, because this is a very common way of understanding dependent origination, but it doesn't really fulfill what I consider the criteria for being dependent origination. Remember, coming back to the second noble truth, Dependent origination is an expansion of the second noble truth, yeah? And the second noble truth is about how dukkha arises via rebirth, and it doesn't really fulfill that. Yeah. Would you like to add anything, Venerable? Uh, no, well, the, why I don't is, uh, as I've said before, I'm not so familiar with some of these uh, different interpretations that we are sort of debunking here. Uh, including this one. I know the suttas, but I never knew that people interpreted the uh, Majjhima Nikaya 18, that's the lower quote, that they interpreted that as the whole of dependent origination until you pointed it out to me a week ago or so. Uh, but there is one uh, misconception that I have heard of before. Can I go for the next one? Or you, 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 want you want to move on to the next one? Yeah. 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 Okay. So, Yep. One of the misconceptions that I saw early on in Buddhism, when I came into Buddhism, is, is the, f the following. And I quote here from uh, some sort of book or website. The 12 conditions form a closed loop. And what I mean by that is, or what they mean by that, is that dependent origination, the 12 conditions or links, that they they interpret them like this, as a circle, and it's 
not very easy to read here on the screen, uh, but these 12 circles, they re represent the 12 vectors uh, that we have seen uh, many times before. So at the top there, you have ignorance, and then all the links they follow, blah, 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 ignorance. They use different translations, but ignorance leads to the willed acts, etc., etc., etc. And then it comes back to the problem, which is suffering, uh, old age and death, which is the uh, last circle. But the strange thing is that in these interpretations, the uh, old age and death, they make it a cycle leading back to ignorance. And this is a very common interpretation. When you Google for dependent origination links, you see here all the different pictures. And they are, many of them have this kind of circular idea in them, you see? You see all these circles? So just to take this one again, I'm talking about this specific link here in the top. Well, again, it's very hard to read here, but just believe me that on the left side of that red circle uh, that I just highlighted, it says aging and death and suffering. And on the right side, it says ignorance. Yeah, But that would be quite problematic if, if suffering and aging and death would lead to ignorance because even if you're enlightened, you still have all day, you can, well, you can die very young, but death is definitely a given. Even the Arahans will have to die, so if they die, does it lead again to more ignorance? No, that doesn't make, doesn't make much sense. So to me, this interpretation uh, is not correct. And I can point it out in more detail by uh, the following example that I found on the internet. This is a bit more readable on the slide. So you see there, uh, again, the same link here in the top. You have there, aging and death is a condition for ignorance, they say. But uh, yeah, the slide is a bit too far zoomed in on the projector for some reason. But what you see on the left there, it says future life. That's how they interpret it. The birth of a future life leads to aging and death. Basically, they have to process of rebirth in there. And then the ignorance they have uh, mentioned as, as a past life. It, you can't see that on the slide here because it's too far zoomed in, but uh, people on the YouTube will probably be able to see it. But yeah, of course I don't have to explain that something from a future life does not condition uh, a past life. That would be a bit awkward. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, maybe that idea comes from these very beautiful Tibetan mandalas where they put the 12 factors of dependent origination. They put them in a circle and they have different pictures to represent all the different factors. But th this circle does not imply that the uh, 12 factors lead to one another in a circle. This is just a, a circle. Uh, it's an artistic idea. It doesn't imply any, anything beyond that. Or, well, it does imply samsara in sort of a sense, but, but if we look at the suttas and not at those pictures that you only find on Google, then we have these kind of things that we've seen before. Um, well, dependent on ignorance, there are willed acts, willed acts, there's consciousness, dependent on consciousness, mental aspects and form, etc., etc. just going down to the bottom here. And depend on birth, there come to be old age and death and sorrow grief pain, sadness, and distress. But the Buddha doesn't say anything about old age and death, dependent on old age and death, there come to be ignorance. He doesn't say that. Not in this sutta, not anywhere else. So uh, if we want to represent dependent origination, we should not put it in a circle like we've seen before, but more like in a, in a linear way. Yeah. Again, I think that the projector is too far zoomed in, so half of the slide sort of disappears below and uh, at the bottom. But uh, if we put all the 12 factors, we should put them linearly like this, stacked upon one another and not going around in a circle. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. yeah. So the point is, old age and death does not lead to more ignorance because 
ignorance is sort of the root, root problem itself. That is the problem, and that is not conditioned by uh, old age and death as such. Having said that, though, in some suttas, the Buddha does include some sort of cycles, independent origination, uh, or he interprets, interprets these links in a slightly different way. Uh, and one of the more interesting ones is where there is a little bit of a cycle between the uh, mental aspects and the form, the nama rupa, and consciousness. These two, they uh, depend upon one another. And we will discuss that later in more detail as we will with all these links. But uh, there is no sutta that says that ignorance or it is conditioned by all age and death. That's sort of my main point there. Okay, so I, I, I wonder whether some of the point of that circle is just to point out that uh, people get reborn again. It may not, you know, it, the way it is presented is presented as if death leads to ignorance, which is, very, which is unfortunate. But I, I think part of the idea of the cycle is just that uh, the cycle of birth kind yeah, of tends yeah. to carry on. That's probably maybe the root idea. And then it gets misinterpreted in a certain way. Yeah, yeah. like yeah. Yeah, Dependent Origination no. described the cycle of rebirth. Yeah. But the sequence itself is not a cycle. Yeah. Because the root problem, ignorance, yeah. remains. And it's not like constantly being recaused every time you get reborn. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay, okay. Um, uh, let me just very briefly talk about this one. We're going to talk about this one. Actually, should I talk about this one? Yeah, okay. Very briefly, and then we'll have a break. Yeah. Um, so this is the idea that uh, rebirth requires a permanent self. Yeah? So whether that's rebirth in dependent origination or just rebirth generally, if you ask people, they will say, well, how can you have rebirth without uh, a, a permanent self? And the idea, I think, is that you know, from a kind of modern, you know, modern point of view, the idea is that the mind depends on the body. So if the body disappears, uh, then the mind will also disappear. And uh, the only way to avoid that is that you have a permanent something inside of you that carries on after you die. Uh, but uh, that whole viewpoint that the body is primary and the mind depends on the body, I, you know, it doesn't really fit with the Buddhist outlook. And it is an outlook which is becoming even, you know, in recent times, even a lot of scientists, you know, especially physicists, would agree that there is something perhaps very wrong with that outlook, because of you know the the, the importance of the mind in, in both in physics and also in neuroscience and all of these things uh, that point to some, being some deeper truth, uh, and that uh, our modern outlook, especially from the Western kind of scientific outlook, often doesn't seem to be it's part of the truth, but it's not the full truth. Uh. So, uh, from a Buddhist point of view, because the uh, you know, because the mind is primary, whether you look within this life or you look across lives, really is the same process carrying on. It doesn't make any difference. So if you can see things being impermanent in this life, no permanent self is required in this life, well, the same thing is true also across lives. Yeah? And mo a lot of people would agree that there is uh, no real requirement for a permanent self in this life. So that also then means that across life should be the same. And this is this particular point is one of the fundamental reasons why the Buddha taught dependent origination. Yeah? I will show you why, why that is the case. We'll come back. I'll talk about this a lot later on because it's a very important point. Uh, and this is also, we're going to talk a little bit later on about the connection between the Brahmanical or Hindu teaching at that time in India and Buddhism. And this is one of those points where the Buddha diverges dramatically from the existing religions. And he, one of the, uh, his response to the Hindu, Hindu teaching or Brahmanical teaching is precisely dependent origination. And I'll show you how that works. Oh. So this is the standard sequence of uh, dependent origination. Yeah, Ignorance leading to willed actions, leading to consciousness, leading to name and form. Uh, there is an alternative way that this is described. Yeah? And it goes like this. And this is, uh, you start off with name and form, or you can say the, the mental and physical aspects or material aspects of a person, apart from consciousness, yeah? Those material and physical aspects, they, they, they condition consciousness, yeah? Consciousness is conditioned by that. Consciousness depends, yeah? To use another term we can do later on, depends on those things for its existence. 
But then, uh, the next then is consciousness conditions uh, name and form. Yeah? So in other words, name and form, or the other aspects of personality apart from consciousness, uh, yeah? uh, they depend on consciousness. Uh. So you can see there's a mutual conditionality that depend on each other. And the, uh, uh, the simile used in the sutta, as Venerable Sunya mentioned last time, is two, two sheaths of straw yeah, standing against each other. Yeah? They depend on each other to be able to stand. You take one away, that one falls down. Take the other one away, that one falls down. So two sheaths of straw, they actually depend on each other. And this is exactly the same for uh, the mental and physical aspects of a human being. Yeah? Yeah? They depend on each other in this way. Yeah? And what that means is that there's nothing in there which is inherent, independent of anything else. Uh, everything is uh, impermanent. Everything relies on something else for existence. Nothing has inherent existence uh, as is postulated in the Brahmanical teaching. So this here is a direct um, counter yeah, to the existing teachings at the time, showing that there is nothing in existence that kind of is underlying everything uh, and it's always there, always present, standing uh, standing as a kind of foundation for the rest of existence. Uh, and then based on that foundation of these two sheaths of reed uh, um, leaning on each other, then the whole rest of the process of dependent origination comes from that. So you then have the sense impressions and you have all the way down the line. Uh. So this is, a, I think, a, a very important point that um, uh, needs to be uh, kind of understood because, in fact, dependent origination is precisely one of the main purposes of the teaching is to show how rebirth and how the process of existence continues without any reference to a self. That is kind of the whole point of it, uh, one of the main points of dependent origination here. Okay, enough on that. Let's uh, take a short break, have another bit of meditation together, and then we'll uh, uh, do some questions and answers afterwards. Here.
Better than coffee, meditation, for energy, I feel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Carl, is there any more things coming in from the outside, or is that is nothing coming up here? Ajahn, uh, okay. we, we, I think we had some problem live streaming just now, so maybe that's why the questions are not coming in. Are there problems still? Yeah. Okay. But we, we are recording anyway. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's the way it goes. Okay. Good. So, uh, any comments, questions about what we have done so far? Yeah. yeah Chris. Bante, can you? Bante, can you um, please switch back to myth number two? Can you flick it back on your computer? How do I do that? Yeah. This one, one, Chris, or a bit further, this? No, I keep going. Uh, yeah, the one where they, they talked about proof. Yeah, that's it. Yep. Um, I'm wondering whether, in fact, you can stop, uh, minimise, stop, reduce the momentum of dependent origination if you, in your life and in your meditation practice, do a meditation practice, for example, where you learn to live at the leading edge of now. These are meditation practices, uh, not so much in Arjan Brahma's tradition, but in other traditions. Um, Although I think actually going into jhanas and that, you, you got to know how to do, be in the leading edge of now. Um, but it actually uh, is the point, there's a point um, for me where I can get before the arising of perceptions and it's a continuous, now it's a very high energy state. Um, um, what I've noticed is that um, if I do those sorts of meditations and stay there, they're, um, one, they're high energy. Two, um, afterwards, they really cut out thinking and proliferation. So that leading edge of now meditation, is that something that would assist in uh, breaking the cycle more and more of dependent origination as a spiritual practice? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'll come back to that in a second again, Chris, because uh, I'm going to talk specifically about... Uh, the fact that you cannot cut feeling from craving, yeah? Mm -hmm. So this is related to this question. Uh, so okay. I'll, I'll get back to that. Uh, but uh, yeah, of course, it, it will definitely assist, uh, but it won't take you all the way. That's Thank kind you. Of, that's kind of the point, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Venerable Sunyu, yeah. I really appreciate your, um, your, okay. your remark on, oh. the, on the linearity and not circularity. Um, and I think it, that delivers to the point that the Buddha was trying to help us dealing with the, the problem or the challenge at hand, which is pretty much the, the situation we find now, right? We were, we were born and we have to deal with it. Uh, and he was not just trying to point us to a big picture or a philosophical view of how things come and go and so on. So the question is, um, is it is it consistently the case that he's always trying to call people's mind to actually the problem of you being born already and you're about to age and die and as long as you haven't addressed the, the, the process, it's gonna happen again? Is, is, is that something that's clearly stated and found ev everywhere or sometimes he goes philosophically and tries to explain something from different perspective? That's my question. I think there's two points in your question. One is, is it philosophical or more experiential? Yeah. And the other point you're making is, do we only look at this life, how it influences next life? Or is there also something uh, to say about uh, past lives? Well, the first one I can think I can answer very briefly. I think the Buddha is trying to point us towards experience and philosophy, if he used it, was only a tool 
to get us to get certain experiences that are uh, that that give us uh, a way out of suffering. Yeah. So that's that, that's the answer to that question. Second question: the Buddha himself and many other people since have actually recalled past lives, and by recalling past lives, it gives you a lot of information about what might happen in the future because the process dependent origination is still going on throughout it's going on throughout the past and it continues into the future so if we only look at this life uh, that then we miss out a lot of information we can miss out on uh, you have to have a very strong mind to be able to uh, recollect your lives your past lives in a way that it allows you to see dependent origination. Uh, some people, they are born and they have these past life experiences, but usually they're not very sharp. They don't see the connection between the lives. Yeah? But if you really have a deeper insight, then you see this connection that happened in the past. And from that, you can infer what will happen in the future. But you, so the past is very important in that sense. On the other hand, you can't tell what's going to happen in the future because it's uncertain. Yeah. But of course, present life is the most important. That's the one we're, we're dealing with. And that's what we can learn the most from. And this, is, this is the life that we have to make, make a difference, hopefully. Does that answer, answer your question? Thanks. OK. Ananda, you want to mm. ask? Okay. With a microphone for Ananda, please. Yeah. 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 I, I have the mic. Ah, okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, excellent. Yeah, yeah. So I just want to uh, clarify the last myth. I just want to check the... So the logic behind the last myth is they think the body is primary, primary, and so to go from one life to another, there must be a permanent self. Is that the idea? I, I don't know exactly how they think, but the idea is that um, seems to be something like that, because a lot of people say, how can you have rebirth without a permanent self? There must be something that you kind of take with you that kind of makes that link from one to another one. Uh, yeah, so they, they would agree that within one life, okay, then you, know, you don't really need to look at a permanent self. Within one life, it can all be changing, no problem. But once you talk about going across from one life to the next one, then suddenly they require a self to make that possible. Uh, and the only way I can see that, that making logical sense, I'm just guessing what the thinking is, uh, that they're coming from a materialist point of view, whereby the body kind of keeps you going. Yeah. But when the body is gone, then you know, what, what carries you on? It, within one life, the body is there, uh, and the mind can move around. Uh, but from one life to the next one, when the body is gone, uh, then something else must be, help you in that, in that thing. And I, I think something like that is going on there. Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, Ajahn, that, uh, I have two questions. One is on this one, Madhupindika. Yeah. And uh, I think this one, uh, I think the next stage, if I remember right, is the proliferation leads to fortify the self. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's Papancha Sanya Sanka. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, therefore, yeah. Can, we, can we think that, uh, will it be all right that if we say these three are subsidiary steps, Perception, thinking, and prol proliferation, yeah. papanya, in between feeling and craving, because proliferation will lead us to craving. So this yeah. probably is a subsidiary and ancillary three yeah. steps. Absolutely. It's very closely related to the idea of craving. And I would think actually craving is part of proliferation, I would say, yeah, already. Yes. So, but Either way, it is part of the same process. Part of the same. Because craving is also a result of the misunderstanding and delusion of the world. Yeah? It comes back to the sense of self and gratifying the sense of self and all of these things. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So it is absolutely subsidiary that it just shows it in a bit more detail. Uh, uh, so, that, so, so yes, I would agree with that. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Because uh, I think the Buddha subsequently says, yeah. I think this was first said by Mahakachan, yeah, 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 yeah. but yeah. he says, whoever who yeah. does not proliferate yeah. will end then and there. Exactly, that's the other so hand. I think that's the craving, yeah, yeah. isn't it, Ajahn? Yeah, that's the yeah. craving. So this is not going away yeah. from the, yeah. this is an additional... It, it is not going away from it. it, it, it in fact, it is it's just uh, a detailed, detailed understanding of that process, a more detailed. Uh, more detailed. The point is just that it's not sufficient to call, be called dependent origination. Dependent yeah. 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 And the uh, second question is, uh, when Sun Yos, that uh, 
cycle, uh, death leading to, I think I haven't looked at that sutta for a long time, but Sabbasava Sutta, it has what is called the Avijasava, Avijasava, which is, I think the explanation there is the Avijasava that we have collected from the previous life is coming to strengthen the Avijja in this life. Is that right? I can't remember that specific quote. Uh, well, of course, if we have Avijja in a past life, we will have it again. Asava, Avijja Asava. I think there are three Kamasava, Bhavasava, Avijjasava. Yeah. So, yeah. I think the third, uh, third of that yeah, is the one that strengthens the Avijja. That's what I think in the last paragraph of that sutta, I think it is there. Sabhasava uh, Sutta, I think. I'm asking yeah. whether it is right. But it, but it doesn't say Avijja is coming from old age and death. Oh, it doesn't uh, say. Yeah. But it's the, the death, apart from the Arahants. Uh, sorry, apart from the Arahants, uh, the others, we, we minors, we minions, uh, carry our Avijjasava into the next life and fortify and strengthen our Avijja. Yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah, but yeah, that's not, not exactly what I was addressing. Though, but yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. I think the idea is that uh, avidja as ignorance, it perpetuates itself. It's self-perpetuating. Yeah. So once you have avidja in one life, it will drive avidja in the next life. Yeah. So that, in that sense, is true. But I think the point that uh, Ben Basunia was making was a little bit uh, slightly different from that, in the sense that it's death. if death gives rise to avidja, you have a serious problem. <laughs> it's, there's no escape, basically. That's what he's saying, if that's the case. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so. Mm. Okay, okay, okay. Anyone else? <laughs> no, in our experience with the uh, dependent origination, yeah. yeah, instead of referring to past life, you know, how many people of us we can refer to past life you now, would it be more appropriate to refer to our earlier life experience in this life? You know? Then we can, we can help us to understand it more. You know, you know, to, to, you know? I, I think if you, do that, our, if, you, if you do that, you are coming back to the idea of a one lifetime dependent origination. Yeah, if, you, if you think of the earlier part of this life. No, no, I, I'm, I'm not saying you take off the link. There is the previous life link, okay? I, we, we, we leave it as it is now. But how can we, we recall the previous life, what we do, you know? So, but earlier life, we, we, you know, it, I mean, understand this thing and then, yeah. and then the, uh, uh, recall back how we experience yeah. pre in this life, you know? You, you understand? Not taking out the I guess I, think, I understand. I'm not sure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so to help us to, to sort of to further strengthen, you know, our understanding through our own experience in earlier life from, from yeah. early, early life. Well yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, often, yeah. often yeah. not childhood. As long as you remember not yeah. yeah. I'm not sure if I get your point 100%, but I have had sometimes heard or read people say that uh, dependent origination, uh, it must be experienced, but we can only experience this life. It sort of comes back to the point made before. That's what people claim. But you, you, can, re you can remember things er from earlier in this life, and you can also remember things from lives before and see how lives before uh, perpetuate the cycle of rebirth. Yeah. So you say personal experience, you equate to this life. But the insight into dependent origination includes uh, an experience that goes beyond just this life. I know that, but I'm just I mean, just your own experience, if you feel like you can like, recall your early life, Mm -hmm. to you know, there is a, this is the thing, there is a, uh, in, in Buddhism, as like in any other religion, there is a degree of confidence and faith required, and there are certain things that require that thing, and rebirth is, uh, is one of those aspects, yeah, so sometimes you just have the things that you have to take on board with, the, with confidence and faith that this is the way it is, and there are, I think there are, for many people, there are some very good reasons for why there is rebirth. And what the biggest one, you know what the biggest one is? What is the biggest reason why there's rebirth? Because the Buddha said so. Yeah? That is my favorite reason, because that's kind of the highest kind of anecdotal evidence. The Buddha said, I saw my past lives, so there, there is past life. To me, that's enough. But uh, 
there's much, much, much more evidence around that the, 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 you know, the idea that rebirth, there is such a thing in the world. Uh, and uh, sometimes you can lean on those things as well. But there will be a degree of uh, confidence and faith that is required, uh, I think, uh, in this particular case. Uh, and I'm not sure, yeah, so. Anyway, can we, shall we carry on here? Yeah? I want to now, I have a good news for Chris. Chris Perrier, this is your, uh, this is now we're going to come to the Myth number five, dependent origination is stopped between feeling and craving. And um, so uh, this, this is a common thing. The idea is that if you are mindful of what happens in your mind, yeah, mindful of what happens in your mind, okay. If you're mindful, then uh, you will be able to see your feelings arise and you'll be able to see your reaction to those feelings. Yeah? You will see that craving arises in one way uh, depending on certain feelings and then the kind of repulsion, the negative craving arises depending on other feelings. And if you have enough mindfulness, you will be able to bypass that craving and you will be able to have a more stable mind which isn't kind of you know, rocked around by these powerful cravings that always are so upsetting, yeah? The mind is kind of like a yo-yo in, in samsara. So you stand back more. You're more able to just observe and not actually buy into the feelings in the same way, yeah? And um, this is, I think, a very important part of the Buddhist teachings, yeah? That, that we do this. This is part of what we call sense restraint. Uh, and it actually gives rise to a mind that is far more even in the world because you don't react to feelings in the same way as you otherwise would. But uh, this can only be taken so far. This cannot be taken to the point where all craving stops. Yeah? This, this is impossible. This can only be taken to the point where craving stops temporarily through mindfulness, through samadhi, through practice of the path. But, and this is where the very powerful, important point of dependent origination comes in, and this is why, one of the main reasons why dependent origination is added to the second noble truth. The second noble truth says that craving is a source of suffering. But if you cannot eliminate craving through merely watching it or through sense restraint, you need to ask yourself, what is the cause of that craving? And it takes it back all the way to ignorance, to avidya. And then you know what you have to do. What you have to do is eliminate ignorance at the beginning of dependent origination. And by that elimination of ignorance, by seeing things according to reality, which means essentially abandoning the delusion of a self, that is the root cause. And that is how craving ultimately is, uh, is ended completely. Because once the delusion of self is gone, you understand that craving is actually... Uh, it doesn't actually get you anywhere, and it's actually the calming and peace of the mind which, uh, which takes you anywhere. So you turn things upside down. Uh, so the point here is that um, you do use mindfulness or even insight on this particular link between feeling and craving to reduce your craving as far as you possibly can, because that reduction in craving is actually what leads to the samatha, the calm of the mind, uh, and all of those things that actually ultimately allows you the samadhi, allows you the depth of meditation that then undercuts avidya at the beginning of the path. Yeah? So you use the, uh, uh, this particular link, uh, reduce the craving, and then that allows the meditation, which then allows the elimination of the root cause, uh, which is ignorance at the beginning. Yeah. Does that make sense, Chris? Have I answered your question? Or? No, microphone here. Yeah. yeah. Bunter, you're sounding dangerously like a Mahayana person there. <laughs> okay, so uh, what I want to say to you is that uh, for me, my sense of self is made up internally of pictures, thoughts, sensations in the body. As I go more and more to the leading edge of now, that dissolves and consequently um, the sense of self dissolves as well. So are you saying kind of like what the Mahayanas say, but also I know that the Theravada say this in certain sutras as well, yeah. that the sense of self-dissolving, the watching of what you just talked about, is the pathway of freedom, that there is actually no doer, no a sense of non-self, that, that has to, which, is not a, which is not a thing in itself. There is no distinction between the two. It goes to a, 
um, a non-dual experience. A non-dual experience. Yeah. Not talked about much in this place, um, although I think it's implied. Ah, it is in the suttas, non-duality. It's called a kata in the suttas. Yeah, so it's there. But, um, yeah, I... I, I Yes, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really worried that you're calling me a Mahayana. That's really... Oh. <laughs> no, no, Bhante, I've, I've, I've got a Guy Armstrong quoted the, some of the uh, yeah. suttas uh, yeah. in, in the imaginary kaya where yeah. you can see the linkage between the Mahayanas and the Theravadas. <laughs> and it, it's, there's references in, uh, yeah. I think it's called the, uh, the, the lump of foam or something in the... Yeah. In the I don't know, I'm not yeah, an expert yeah. in these sorts of things. But the, thi the, the thing is, is that, yes, you, you can dissolve the ego, but it's not just dissolving the ego, it's actually eliminating the underlying tendency to ego. So let's say that you dissolve it temporarily, yeah? But then it comes back again once you come out. Yeah, and, yeah, very, and very often what it does when you come out, let's say that you have a very profound experience of unity, of, of mindfulness, or of samadhi, whatever it is, uh, and then very often that particular state of unity or samadhi that you had, the, the sense of self will take that as it's, that, that will be, that's me, yeah, that is me, yeah. wow, I came out of jhana, wow, that was really cool, I was unified with the whole world, there was no complete non-duality, that's non-duality in Buddhism, is actually samadhi experiences, that's actually non-duality, because there's no, there is no, the object, subject separation is completely gone, there's only one experience, yeah, that's kind of the point, yeah. and when you come out of that, and you have the non-duality, you have supreme bliss, uh, you have feel incredibly powerful, yeah? It is very, very, very tempting to take that as the real you, because that's what it feels like, yeah? It's, especially if you have no lacking in right view, you're gonna take it as the real you, and that is the problem. Uh, the I am tendency is this, called the asmi man anusaya, the underlying tendency to I am is still within you, and it will take these states as their object, take that as the real you. So you haven't really uprooted the eye delusion, that's, that's the point. So that's why you need to come back to avidya. That you need to use that samadhi to go even deeper in insight, to to, re, to eliminate the entire underlying tendency of the idea I am. That's what you have to do. Otherwise, it will always return, always come back again, and that will then lead to rebirth. The underlying tendency I am is sufficient to lead to rebirth in the future. Okay. Yeah. yeah uh, there's a there's a process um, that uh, certainly happening more in my life, where, you're, where I'm finding I'm able to actually move through the world um, without a sense, less of a sense of self. Okay. And psychologists call it executive function. You can actually do the shopping, get the right change at shops and all that sort of stuff, yeah. and stop yeah. at red lights and go at green lights without having a sense of will involved yeah. in it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And um, I, I th is that kind of like what you're talking about, to be able to... Uh, yeah. Marvelous. That's uh, live the life yeah. of serendipity. M wonderful. That's a great. That's, it's a very, very conducive on the path. Yeah, it's very useful because it means that you have less defilements and problems, and you're flowing through life more easily. And it basically, it's, a, it's just a higher degree of mindfulness in many ways. You have more mindfulness of what's going on, and of course, that's very useful. But it's not enough. Yeah, that's the point. Well, one of the things that's implied in what you're saying is that yeah. you need to take what you experience in meditation in in those clear vision states. Yeah in what other teachers have called motion challenges, out of deep meditation into eyes open, and then eyes open in walking, and then eyes open in doing activities around the, the world, in, 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 in still maintaining that, that, that perspective that you've just been talking about. I mean, the, the Mahayanas talk a lot about that sort yeah, of Yeah, well, stuff. I mean, the perspective is changed in meditation, but if it's changed deeply enough, you don't have to take it into the world, it's automatic, it comes, in, it comes with you afterwards. If the insight is deep enough, uh, then you bring that with you regardless. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Venerable Munisraha, can we have a microphone, please? Can I just clarify, Jan, when you said that um, sensory trait can be used to reduce craving uh, enough to improve your samadhi and therefore lead to insight, are you speaking there mainly of um, the gamma? Tanha, but not the, sorry, what is that in English? The, the desire for sensory, sensory experience, but not so much the craving to be. I mean, can sense restraint reduce the craving to be as well? <coughs> well the two are not entirely separate. There is a lot of overlap, yeah? I mean, why, ultimately, the reason why we have 
desire for the sensory experience is, is ultimately comes back down to the you know, craving to exist as well. It's a way of expressing your existence uh, through those desires as well. They're, they're sort of interrelated, but uh, that is the main point, yeah. And if you can reduce that, uh, you also need to reduce your ego a little bit. Yeah? You don't have to reduce your kind of your desire to act all the time, yeah. That's action is very often rooted also in the in the in the idea of sens of uh, desiring the sensory objects. Because when you desire the sensory objects, it involves the activity of the mind. You go out and you chase these things. So one reason why we desire things in the world is because it gratifies our sense of I am. I am the doer. I do things. So we attach to craving. We are craving. And we, we identify with craving to some extent. So they're not entirely, they are interrelated to some, some extent. But uh, basically you're right. Because by, uh, if you focus on the cravings for sensory objects, uh, then that will ultimately, if you can focus on that, that will take you all the way to samadhi, yeah, basically. Yeah. That is the root problem for samadhi practice. And that will take with it, I think also as you do that, it will also reduce the sense of self automatically because that will, you know, it will just come with it basically. Yeah. Okay. Am I, yeah, yeah? yeah, yeah. <laughs> Something like that, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. okay, let's, let, let's uh, move on a little bit uh, because uh, it's already two o'clock. Um, would you like to say anything, Venerable? No, again, I'm also not very familiar with the background to this myth itself, so, yeah. Yeah. Myth. This is, this is just the um, slide of that uh, myth, myth that the, uh, you know, just, uh, this is how things craving arises, and as I, I think I've talked enough about that. Uh, let's move on to the next one. Yeah. Myth number six. Dependent origination means everything is interconnected. Yeah. And this is something you can you find on the internet, of course, yeah. and you find it yeah, in the uh, description of dependent origination found in Wikipedia. You find this uh, idea actually mentioned by certain schools. So everything is interconnected here. Yeah. So is everything interconnected? Maybe, yeah. There's a lot of connection in the world, that's for sure. And I think one of the things about this idea, it is kind of... Uh, it's a nice idea for our world where we, you know, people tend to, we are very, people are very tribal, it's my tribe against your tribe, or we are very individualistic, it's me against the world and this kind of stuff. And the idea that we are interconnected is very useful to make us more cooperative and to work with each other rather than always work against each other. So I think it's a beautiful idea, it has a nice sentiment to it. And of course, there's a lot of truth to it, yeah? climate change, uh, all the problems in the world, there's a lot of interconnection in these things. And unless we work together, we're not going to be able to solve these massive problems of humanity. Yeah. Uh, so that is it true in one sense, yeah? And this is what I mean by it's kind of a, has a lot of sentimental value. You, you know, this is one of the, when I Googled on interconnectedness, this is one of the things I saw on the internet. Yeah. And that kind of, it's kind of nice, yeah? We're all kind of joined together. We're all holding together in a certain way. And you have Australia right there in the middle at the bottom. Yeah. So uh, Australia is also interconnected. Yeah. We're, not, we're not an island. Yeah? Yeah. We, are, <laughs> we are interconnected. So uh, it has a nice sentimental value. But, is this, but one thing is the idea of interconnection, which is very useful. Yeah. But the sec other question is whether that actually is what dependent origination is about. And that is a very different question here. Yeah. Often an idea may be correct, but it may not necessarily be related to a particular teaching like dependent origination. And this is indeed precisely the problem in this case. Because if you say everything is interconnected, it doesn't really help you very much. The purpose of dependent origination is to find a solution to the problem of suffering. That's what it is about. And if you say everything is interconnected, it doesn't really help you to find a solution because you don't know where to start. Yeah, okay, Ooh, uh, okay, there are all these conditions that lead to suffering. It doesn't really get to the issue of what to do with this. So the purpose of dependent origination is to show specific causes for why things happen. Because when you know specific causes, that is when you can start dealing with the problem because you go to the specific cause uh, or actually cause. Remember, Sunni has taught me that cause is wrong here. Uh, it should be... I, wrong. Okay, I, but I agree with you. I think, I think you have a point, actually. You have a good point. So I agree with that. Uh, 
So, but conditionality, yeah, there are specific conditions that are very powerful in driving this thing. And when you understand the specific conditions, that is when you can do something. Everything is interconnected, it's too woolly, it's too amorphous to really be able to pinpoint anything and any way forward in dealing with these things. So, so this particular doctrine is, actually has a name in the suttas, it's called Ibda Pachyata, and we're going to look more about this afterwards, and it specifically means something like this conditionality with this as cause, yeah? or specific conditionality, in other words, a specific condition for a particular result. Uh, and this is what it looks like in the suttas. Uh. So it's specific conditionality, yeah? And uh, this is one aspect of this particular type of conditionality. When this exists, that is. Uh, and due to the arising of this, that arises. Uh, yeah? So there's a particular thing that arises, uh, and that leads to a particular result. Uh, this is what it is about. Uh. And, uh, of course, when you look at the sequence, it is a sequence of very specific things. Yeah? And then you have the reverse, and that is the idea that when uh, uh, this does not exist, in other words, when one thing ceases, uh, then the result also ceases as a consequence. Uh, so when there is birth, you have to have death. Yeah? There's no choice in the matter. But if there isn't birth, actually then death cannot happen, because death depends on birth in the first place. So, so specific conditions leading to specific results, not just a, a kind of amorphous, everything is interconnected. Yeah. And now I've come, we're coming to the last myth. Yay, last myth. <laughs> and, uh, so, something about, about this also, about everything being interconnected. Is that dependent origination? To me, it's already clear when I look at the links of independent origination that that is not what dependent origination is about. Because let's start at the end. It starts with uh, old age and death. This is a very individual thing. What is the condition for old age and death? It's birth. This is also an individual birth. It's not like the birth of somebody else is, is the reason for the death of me. Yeah? So the way I look at all the links in dependent origination, they imply, imply one, one being, basically. The ignorance of one being is, mm. in the end, the underlying reason for the uh, suffering of that mm. being himself. And of course, through our ignorance, we also cause other people suffering. This is, uh, this, is a, this is a part of life. But that is not really what dependent origination teaches because we can only solve our own suffering in the end. We can only get ourselves out of samsara, and we can't really kick somebody else out of samsara. It would be nice if we could do that, but uh, yeah, that's not the way it works. So. so they are, in a sense, all internal causes. All the, all the conditions lie within us, in a sense, uh, ultimately. Yeah. 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 OK, let's come to the last myth. Yeah, and uh, it is uh, the following one. Yeah, dependent origination is too intellectual. This was one of the things that came from the outside. The idea that sometimes you hear that uh, uh, dependent origination, you know, just leave it to one side, be practical, practice the path, and this is just, uh, uh, you know, no need to read the suttas and all of these kind of things that you sometimes hear. Um, and uh, in a certain context, I think this is right, but uh, um, uh, let, us, let, us see, let us have a look at some of the reasons why, why I think this is a very limited view of things. Uh, so, um, oh, this should have come one by one, I forgot that one. Anyway, so the Buddha, the first thing is that we need to remember that dependent origination is very integrated into the suttas. It's part and parcel of what the suttas, what the Buddha taught, part of the EBTs. And if the Buddha taught it, it must be for a reason. It's not a, just a philosophical thing that he puts out there. Yeah, there is a reason why he teaches these things, because it is intimately linked with the idea of liberation. 
Yeah, that is why the Buddha teaches these things. Everything has ultimately a practical and pragmatic reason in, the, in Buddhism. Remember the Buddha, he takes up the leaves in the um, Gosinga Grove. I don't know if you, some of, for those of you who don't know, the Buddha, in one of the famous stories in the suttas, the Buddha picks up a handful of leaves. Yeah, this is a place called the Gosinga Grove in ancient India. And he says to the monks and the nuns and whoever is there, he says, uh, uh, bhikkhus, monks, what is more, the leaves in my hand or all the leaves in the trees overhead? And the monks say, oh, the leaves overhead are more. They are surprised. <laughs> So they're very kind of, they, they say what they're supposed to say. And then the Buddha says, well, in the same way as the leaves overhead are more, as the leaves in my hand, in the same way, the teachings I have taught you are fewer, but the things that I know, yeah, or I have realized is far more, just like the leaves overhead. And then he says, why have I taught you those things? Well, because they lead to the end of suffering. Yeah. Why have I not taught you all the leaves overhead? Because they don't lead to the end of suffering. Yeah. So it, the, the criteria for deciding whether a teaching is worthwhile is precisely pragmatic. The criteria is it leads to the end of suffering and it has an advantage for all of us. Uh, so this must also be true for dependent origination. It is not just a, a kind of intellectual thing. It actually is part and parcel of the idea of liberation. And again, we will look more at this uh, in detail later on. Uh, and um, it then gives an overview of the idea of existence, what existence is about. And once you start to get a feeling for dependent origination and you see how it works, it tends to give rise to a confidence. Yeah? When I see the Buddha's teaching and how it works, the more I understand dependent origination, I can actually see, wow, this is really very interesting and very applicable to my own life. You start to see the whole process in yourself after a while. Yeah? And again, all of these things we're going to talk about in the, in the following weeks. Uh, and when you see that, it gives rise to very strong confidence. Yeah, the Buddha really, he actually really analyzed these things in a very beautiful way. Yeah? And uh, that drives you, I think, more into the Buddha's teachings. It give, makes you greater ability to practice. The more confidence you have, uh, the greater is also your ability to practice these teachings uh, because you understand that there is a very urgent message here. Uh, yeah? And for all of these reasons, Dependent origination is actually very practical. It comes down to what matters. So, but I want to briefly just say a little bit about why it is that sometimes people say that dependent origination is too intellectual. Even reading the suttas is too intellectual. I, I was speaking with Ajahn Brahm this morning and he told me that in the monasteries he stayed in Thailand. He stayed at Wat Papong for a long time. The Tipitaka, yeah, the suttas and everything, they would all be in a glass cabinet. Yeah, they were all nicely placed in a glass cabinet, beautiful wood, yeah, because the pit the pit was, was in there. But the glass cabinet was locked, and nobody had the key. Yeah? So you come every day, you bow down to the suttas, and then you kind of pass by and you move on. This is kind of the traditional way sometimes of, of uh, relating to the suttas. And uh, so this is a problem. Why does that, how does this thing come about? Why do these things come about? And, one of the reasons why it comes about is because we have lost touch with the early Buddhist teachings. Uh, yeah, I, you read about how the Buddhist education is done in places like Thailand, uh, especially, maybe, I'm not sure what it is now, but especially at that time. Uh, and very often the things that you learn are not actually the early Buddhist teachings. Uh, Usually, if you look at the syllabus for the Pali classes, for example, uh, that monks go through, uh, very often it has to do with the stories of Buddhism. Yeah? The, uh, the, all the like, Jataka tales, the birth stories of, of the Buddha in past lives, uh, or some of the very famous tales you find in the Dhammapada has all these kind of tales behind the verses in the Dhammapada, found in the commentary to the Dhammapada. Beautiful. Some of the stories are really nice, yeah? but it is not the word of the Buddha. And these are the things that they would translate and how they would learn. Or they might read the Visuddhimagga sometimes. Uh, or they might read even perhaps the Abhidhamma occasionally. Uh, but very often it led to a feeling that these things are not directly related uh, to what we are supposed to do as monastics. Yeah? It is not, doesn't, it's not all that relevant. So, so the tendency was to throw out all the learning here yeah? because they, weren't, they didn't have the historical background to be able to separate out the EBTs with the later teachings. Yeah, remember I was starting the very first, last Saturday, I was saying that uh, 
to be able to do that, you have to have a historical overview. Huh? You have to be able to compare the Chinese Agamas, perhaps with the suttas, to understand that Buddhism is this vast thing that stretches out uh, over the world. If you don't have, have that overview and you only focus on your little culture, it is much more difficult to see that there is this kind of uh, layeredness uh, to the, to the uh, Pali texts. Uh. So once you stand back and you see that, uh, and you have a bit more clarity about what the early Buddhist texts are, where the Buddhist teachings are, then uh, it actually changes that whole view. And then it makes far more sense to read the suttas, because now you know this is the word of the Buddha. This is practical. It does relate directly to what we're doing here. It is not just theory and all of that. So I think this is where that comes from, this idea that you shouldn't study too much, because they actually weren't really, they didn't really know exactly what to study, yeah? because there wasn't that, lacking that clarity. And that idea, because some of these teachers from the 20th century, people like Ajahn Shah, they were very, very powerful teachers. So the things that they said then is still being used now as a reason for not studying. And this is then how it comes to be known as too intellectual. Yeah? What's the point of reading, studying? Yeah, throw it all out, just practice. But of course, that is very, very problematic. Because the problem is that unless you are anchored in something, how do you know who to listen to? How do you know that this teacher who contradicts that teacher, who contradicts that teacher, who contradicts, they're all contradicting each other, how do you know who's right? One teacher says there's an eternal mind. Another teacher says that the mind stops when you reach Parinibbana. Which one is right? Well, the only way to solve these things. One teacher says you should do Vipassana meditation. Other one says you should do Samatha meditation. One teacher says there is a rebirth. Another says there is no rebirth. How do you resolve these issues? And really, there's only one way of doing that. Coming back to the teachings of the Buddha. What did the Buddha teach? And not to do that is very dangerous, and actually it leads to the decline of Buddhism unless we do that. The Buddha says so himself, specifically in the suttas. He, he warns against the idea of just listening to disciples, just listening to poets, just listening to all of these other teachers who don't have the profound teachings of the Buddha. He warns against that, and he says it will lead to the decline of Buddhism unless we actually come back to the gold standard, the base, the foundation upon which everything else is built. That is what we should come back to. Otherwise, we have a very, very serious problem in Buddhism. So this matters. It doesn't just matter a little bit. It actually matters enormously that we come back to these teachings, yeah? especially as monastics, because uh, this is kind of our job. Yeah? This is what we do. So it matters uh, significantly. So when I hear that dependent origination is too intellectual, no need to study it, no need to study the suttas, uh, I think it is, uh, it is a, a relic of a history of how Buddhism has been taught in certain Buddhist cultures. Uh, and it is something that is an idea that actually can very easily lead us all astray if we hold on to that, that idea. I've got a question, Ajahn. Question, fire away. Do, do you think our course is also too intellectual? <laughs> So far, pretty intellectual. So far, pretty disappointing, isn't it? Our course uh, is really too intellectual. And we promise to, I promise anyway, I don't know what you, what you promise, I'm not going to talk for you, but I promise that we're going to make it more practical as we go along. Yeah, we have, so far, we have been kind of looking at the overview and background. And actually, intellectual, you, next, next one you're going to do, that's, even, that's pretty intellectual as yeah. well, isn't it? Uh, yeah? It's a bit of a problem, I feel. I asked Ajahn Brown when I was invited to do the course, I asked him, I find it so difficult to bridge a gap between experience and teaching things because when you teach things you have to use words and words tends to get you into this intellectual realm so I feel this, and while teaching this course I'm struggling a bit to teach things in such a way that they are useful and inspiring so if things sound too intellectual it's just uh, for me anyway I have a problem to bridge this, bridge this gap between thoughts and not thoughts, yeah, science, because insights, they are not, they're not thoughts. You don't think your way through dependent origination to really see it. It's much deeper than that. It, it goes so far beyond thought. Uh, yeah, you see, I'm struggling already to explain. <laughs> <laughs> but I hope everybody can relate to, to this to some extent. Everybody who has meditated before knows that Whatever small little piece or whatever nice experiences you've had in meditation, whatever insight you've had, you can't really 
tell that to anybody else properly, you know, it's all, you're always missing, missing the sauce or you, like, who has seen the movie The Matrix? Huh? I've seen that as a lay person and in The Matrix, it starts out with this uh, person and he's living in some sort of fantasy computer world and his mind is basically sort of under delusion and then he meets somebody else in the movie and that person offers him a pill and they say if you take this pill Hachibamani, then you will see reality <laughs> you will see how that you were deluded all this time and I wish there was a pill like that we could give or take like here take this pill Thomas, and you will understand the pen origination. But the pill is the meditation that yeah. we have to do. And we can't feed you meditation. All we can do is feed you words. And words quickly become intellectual. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. But I, th I think the nice thing about it is that uh, ultimately that's what the Buddha did as well. Yeah? He used words to express these profound truths. Uh, and he had an amazing effect. Yeah? Two and a half thousand years later, we're still here you know, talking about these things. Yeah. So I think that there is an impact sometimes, even with words, that actually point you in the right direction. You know? oh, yeah, so, I don't uh, disagree with that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So hopefully that will... Uh, yeah. That has to be a sort of a balance between yeah. your own experience and what yeah. other people can share. Yeah. yeah. Otherwise, we have to cancel the rest of the course. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> or we just sit here and meditate. Yeah. Or we sit here and meditate. Yeah, 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 cool. yeah, maybe next time we can do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so uh, a few more minutes. Uh, because uh, there is one thing I promised to talk about. There's never enough time. I don't know what happens to time. What happens to time? <laughs> anyway, so I promised to talk a little bit about. Actually, now we have come to an end of this one. So now we're going to bring up another. This, we're going to bring up a session. We only didn't finish session one. We are, but we are already. Okay, so. Well, we have a, we we have have a problem. To, we have to fast forward. We have yeah, to fast forward. Do it. You do it, yeah. Otherwise, it's going to take forever. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Thank you. There we go. This is what you're looking for, right? Okay, good. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, Buddhism. As it, it, we need to always remember that Buddhism emerged in ancient India two and a half thousand years ago. And what it emerged from was a very strong existing Indian culture. And one of the main aspects of that existing culture were what is now known as Brahmanism. Brahmanism is the precursor to Hinduism. Yeah? It's the ancient version of Hinduism, much less developed than Hinduism. But still, it is the, the root from which Hinduism basically came uh, and has evolved over two and a half thousand years. Uh, and that was the, probably the biggest, the most important cultural influence of ancient Indian society. There was also the Samana movement. The Samana means the ascetics, the various religious groups of people who would... Uh, practice and they would kind of, you know, this were part of what the Buddha was part of. They would remove themselves from society and they would practice meditation and things in the forest. And these were the Samanas. And there was a large number of different groups of Samanas. And the Buddha was really only one of those large number of groups. And they all had different ideas, all had different teachings. And they would argue with each other. They would meet in meeting places and they would argue the points out. And they would say things that, your teaching is wrong, my teaching is right. This is actually what it, this is what it says in the suttas. Yeah? You know, save your doctrine if you can. They were pretty kind of in your face, yeah? those, these ancient Indians. I don't know if they still do that in India. Do they? Where is... Yeah, I'm not sure if anyone has been to India recently. So um, it came out of this Brahmanical uh, religion, this Brahmanical um, cultural force that was really uh, the main aspect of Indian culture at that time. So because Buddhism came out of that, uh, it is influenced by that, and it had to respond to the Brahmanical ideas, yeah, to make its claim to being a separate religion, it had to respond to those ideas. Uh, and so the point here is that, you know, when we read the Buddhist teachings, uh, we should remember that a lot of it is a response to Brahmanism. First of all, it is a response in the sense that when the Buddha spoke, he would have used the vocabulary and ideas that already existed in that culture. Yeah? 
So a lot of the words already exist, like the word arahant, for example, already existed. And then the arahant means like a fully awakened one, yeah, a fully enlightened person. And then he would have used uh, that idea, but given it a new meaning that then made sense within the Buddhist context. And a lot, almost all the words used by the Buddha are existing ideas that he, he takes. And in other words, the Buddha depends on the existing language. He cannot remove himself from that culture and use a different language because then nobody would understand. He had to use the language that actually was there. And then, more importantly, he had to respond to the ideas that Brahmanism were, were espousing. So he had to kind of create his own teaching in relation to the Brahmanical teaching here. Yeah. Uh, and this is uh, important to understand. I, I kind of like this uh, little slide because it says a little bit about, I think, uh, about how we sometimes think about Hinduism versus Buddhism. Yeah, Hinduism is this very colorful religion. Yeah. And it has all of these gods. This is here is Ganesh, Ganesh, the elephant god. Ganesh didn't exist yet at the time of the Buddha. So this is a bit unfair, this comparison, because uh, one is much later than the other one. Yeah. But uh, Hinduism is more kind of, uh, uh, is, Buddhism is more, uh, lit, is more kind of um, realistic, if you like, or more, is more realism, yeah? it's down, more down to earth, uh, whereas Hinduism is very much, uh, very kind of colorful in many ways. And I think this kind of makes that point quite, quite well. So Buddhism was like a corrective, perhaps, to the colorfulness and the otherworldliness of uh, uh, the Brahmanical teaching here. And one of the areas in which uh, Buddhism challenged uh, Hindu, uh, Brahmanism was uh, in regard to this one here. Yeah? So all religions, including Hinduism, they have an idea of the creation of the world. And this is kind of one of the main reasons why we traditionally have religions. And if you look at all the big religions in the world, you know, Christianity and all the Abrahamic religions, Islam and all that, they have their idea of the God creating the world. Hinduism has its own idea of how the world came into being. Yeah? So this is kind of one of the mainstays of religion to explain how the world comes about, the creation of the world. And then the Buddha comes along, yeah? and instead of saying the creation of the world, what the Buddha talks about is rebirth. So the Buddha's idea of creation is actually the rebirth process. Yeah? And what is fascinating here is that uh, there's an uh, article written by a Polish uh, scholar, her name is Joanna Jurewicz, I'm not sure how you pronounce her name, I, uh, something like that, and she wrote a, an article called Playing with Fire, and in this article she shows the parallels between the creation myth of Brahmanism with dependent origination. Yeah? And uh, it seems to me that there is a fair, fair, fair likelihood that the Buddha would have used some of those ideas of the Brahmanical creation myth and then rephrased them to make the case for dependent origination. Yeah? He may have used those ideas almost uh, uh, slightly on purpose uh, to reformulate the idea of creation. Yeah? So Brahmanism talks about the creation of the world. Yeah? Uh, actually, more than that, talks about the creation of the world, it talks about the creation of people, it talks about the creation of uh, the inner self, uh, who we are as inner selves. Uh, and so basically, it's the creation of everything, is what Brahmanism talks about. Uh, but Buddhism talks about rebirth, and in Buddhism, rebirth is what creation really is. Uh, yes, the, pal the, the words used here, and I think I come to them later on, uh, are very closely related to each other. Uh, yeah, so rebirth is the kind of the new way of thinking about this. And of course, much more practical. Yeah, creation of the world, it is, we shall see later on, I've come to some of these examples. It is very kind of flowery and a strange myth, the creation of the world. Whereas the idea of rebirth is a very kind of practical thing that has to do with our individual continuation in the world. That is a new way of thinking about it. Now, what, what is interesting about this is that it may seem as if these two are very different things, the yeah? creation of the world on the one, on one hand and rebirth on the other. But actually, from a Buddhist point of view, the idea of rebirth actually is the creation of the world. Because what is the world? Well, the world, says the Buddha, is our own experience. 
Yeah? Uh, the Buddha says, specifically says in the uh, Rohitasa Sutta in the Anguttara Nikaya 4, he says that uh, the world yeah, and the beginning of the world and the end of the world exists in this fathom long body with its perception. Yeah? So the world is what you are experiencing now. This is the world. Yeah? There isn't really the external world. We can't really say anything about that. But what we can say something about is our experience. Yeah? This is the main, the basic truth that we can always come back to is our own experience. Yeah? So in a sense, we do create the world when we get reborn because that world of personal experience gets perpetuated through rebirth. Yeah? So these may seem like very different ideas, but when it comes back down to things, actually they are very similar to each other, surprisingly so. Yeah. But it is made more practical, and this is the difference between, I think, the Buddhist idea and the Brahmanical idea. I'm going to go a little bit over time, so please, uh, please hang in there. If you, really, if you want to go, you are welcome to do so. But uh, uh, I'm going to spend a few more extra minutes. Yeah. And... Um, so this is the first response to Brahmanism. The idea of creation gets reinterpreted uh, in a new way and deals with rebirth instead of the creation of the world in a traditional way. The other one, which is a very important response to Brahmanism, is the idea of self versus non-self. If you look at the Brahmanical uh, creation myth, it is all about how the self arises and how the self builds itself up. Yeah? You start with the absolute, and then the absolute wants to build itself up. And what it builds up is the Atman. And the Atman is the same word we have in the Pali, Atta in Pali, Atman in Sanskrit. And uh, so this is actually the whole creation myth in Brahmanism, is the development and the evolution of the self. Buddhism is the exact opposite. Yeah? The whole purpose of the creation myth in Buddhism is to show how rebirth, how the development of the world happens precisely without a self being involved. It's an impersonal process that happens, happens automatically. And the things that Brahmanism takes to be a self, actually, according to the Buddha, if you look at it carefully, all turns out to be non-self. These are phenomena that depend on other phenomena. Nothing stands by itself. Nothing is independent, as I showed you just before with the idea of the uh, mutual conditionality between consciousness and the other aspects of personality. Yeah, they mutually condition each other. This is the second way in which Buddhism or dependent origination is a response to Brahmanism. Desirable versus undesirable. Most religions around the world, when you talk about creation, people say, yay, creation, hooray, finally we come into existence. The God has created us. Thank you, God, for creating us. Wow, we are so lucky to have a creator like you. You are the best, God. Yay, we're going to worship you from now on because you're the best. That is the kind of traditional uh, theistic worldview. It's very life-affirming, very, very affirming that, exi that existence is good, yeah? But uh, I don't know if you have read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, but at the beginning of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, I think we have discussed it, mentioned it before, at the very beginning, uh, it says something like, uh, in the beginning the world was created. It should have said in the beginning God created the world, but it's a bit more, I get a bit more diplomatic. So it said in the beginning the world was created, uh, and many people agreed that was a big mistake. Uh, it's a marvelous beginning of a book. Yeah? It's like, whoa, here is someone who really kind of has a Buddhist outlook to things. Uh, so traditionally, creation is desirable, but in Buddhism, all creation leads only to one place, and that is what dependent origination about, is about. It all leads to suffering, yeah? Dependent origination, the creation aspect of Buddhism always has suffering as its outcome. Yeah? So it actually is really undesirable, and that is why we try to end rebirth. We are trying to end creation rather than allow it to perpetuate itself. So it's a very different worldview in Buddhism than we have in almost any other religion. Creation is undesirable. In almost everywhere else, creation is considered desirable. Mythology versus realism. If you read, and I'm going to show you some examples in a, very, in a moment between Brahmanism and Buddhism, Brahmanism is full of mythology. It's weird stories. I'm going to show you in a second how weird they are. 
Whereas Buddhism, it's very realistic. It's down to earth. Okay, you crave. When you crave, you build up your sense of self. You take things up. You're attached to the world. You think in certain ways. That craving then leads on to rebirth. And it's very tangible, even though the idea of rebirth is a little bit out of reach. It is generally very tangible, the whole thing. Realism versus mythology. Aye. How come? Okay, there we are. Okay. Then uh, uh, the last point here is the idea of redefinition and a, a, a polemic against something else. And the idea of redefinition is that the Buddha uses this teaching of uh, dependent origination to redefine certain core ideas uh, that exist in Brahmanism. Yeah? The idea of ignorance is changed. Uh, uh, the idea of sankara is actually fairly similar, but uh, then you have vinyana. The idea of vinyana is changed. The idea of namarupa is changed. Yeah, upadana is changed. Uh, uh, so he, cha he takes this opportunity to redefine many of these terms uh, to make it into his teaching, rather than being uh, leaning on uh, Brahmanism too much. And then he uses it as a polemic, yeah, as a way of arguing against Brahmanism. Once you have created a new way of looking at the world and you say this is the way things are, then of course uh, uh, that becomes in itself an argument against the old worldview, especially if it is uh, convincing. If you come up with a very convincing thing and you can show how silly the old version looks in comparison, you kind of bring people over to your teaching. In a sense, it is a polemic. It's a way of convincing people that you have something profound and useful that will help them out. So sort of comes down to the more we understand certain aspects of Brahmanism, the more we can understand certain parts of dependent origination. I think that's, in, that's in, absolutely part of it. So we can understand the idea of non-self in large part, because, uh, in contra to the, uh, yeah, in, contra in contradiction, in contradistinction to the idea of selves, for example, in, in Brahmanism, yeah. But it's not so useful these days, I think, as it was at that time. At that time, it was much more useful because you had a very specific worldview that you wanted to argue against. Of yeah. course, for us, we are so far removed from that uh, that for us, it's not so important. Uh, for us, it is important if we have doubts about what something means in Buddhism, then we can sometimes find the meaning by going back to the Brahmanical terms. Uh, yeah. Okay, so this is the... Um, Creation according to Hinduism, yeah? It's very colorful again. This is how the universe gets created. Yeah, yeah I, I don't I have no idea what the symbolism is here, to be honest with you. But I think the, the, the being lying down is Krishna. And then you can see that something coming out of the navel of Krishna, something like that. And then the world somehow gets created, something like that. I'm not going to... And then you have the Buddhist idea of creation, yeah? So... One is kind of simple yeah, and, and not very colorful, perhaps even boring. Yeah. So th those people who like colorful religions, don't come to Buddhism. Yeah, stay away, because you're going to get bored out of your skull if you come to Buddhism. <laughs> Maybe not. I, I, anyway, so creation of the world versus rebirth. Yeah? So this is... Uh, um, this is the Brahmanical. This is from this book called The uh, Playing with Fire, which talks about the comparison of the Brahmanical teaching to the Buddhist teaching. And this is how the world gets created according to the Brahmanical teaching. The appearance of darkness hidden by itself. So this is like the beginning. This is similar to the idea of, of ignorance in Buddhism. Yeah? And uh, the difference is that um, uh, here everything is dark. So you're ignorant about everything. Yeah? Whereas in Buddhism, it's a very specific kind of ignorance we are talking about, and we'll see this later on. It's basically a distortion of reality in Buddhism, whereas in Brahmanism, it's a complete unknowing of anything. It's just everything is dark. Even the darkness itself is unknowable because it's hidden by itself. Yeah? That's kind of how deep it goes in the Brahmanical teaching. Yeah? Then you have the manifestation of the creative power of the Absolute. So, again, a very fundamental difference between Brahmanism and Buddhism is that Brahmanism assumes the Absolute. The Absolute is like Brahma. Yeah? It's like the, the God in the background. And, uh, so this, and the God has this creative power. And this creative power is really Sankara, the second link of dependent origination. It is always there as a hidden potential. And it comes with the Absolute as the 
as the creator. Yeah? This is the creative force in Brahmanism, very similar to Sankara. And then uh, this cosmogonic, cosmogonic means creator of the cosmos, uh, this cosmogonic creator's wish to create the Atman is sometimes expressed by the verb uh, sang, sankaroti, yeah? sankar is the same word as sank sankara. So they use exactly the same word for creation as we use in Buddhism. In fact, I think a good translation for sankara might be creation. Yeah? Avidja leads to creation. Ignorance leads to creation. It, maybe that's a bit challenging. Yeah, you can imagine. The, I don't know what the other religions will say. Ignorance leads to creation. What are you saying? Are you telling me God is ignorant? Or what are you saying here? <laughs> okay, so maybe we, sometimes you have to be diplomatic. Yeah. You have to find the, thread that fine line between diplomacy and seeing things from a Buddhist point of view. But I think from a Buddhist point of view, forget about, uh, you know, it's, it's not really meant as a criticism of other religions. Uh, but from a Buddhist point of view, you could argue that c any creation actually comes from ignorance. Uh, if you're not ignorant, uh, you won't create, basically. Uh, and this is kind of the point here. Uh. And then comes the how the creator then creates, yeah? He devours food with his eating part. <laughs> Thus, uh, Prajapati builds himself up. It's Atman again. Atmana, you see there. Abhisankaroti, again, is the idea of Sankara, which is the natural consequence of eating. So he, you eat. Yeah, that's how you create things, according to this one. It's very kind of interesting. So you create, and what you create is the Atman. You see here, the Atman comes through this, yeah? The self which is ultimately identical with Brahma, the Absolute, all of these things coming together. And then, this is how this creation continues. He kills the animals, cut off, cuts off their heads, puts them on, and throws the torsos into the water. Then he looks for the torsos, calling them himself, Atman again. He takes water and earth, which was in contact with the torsos of the animals, and builds bricks. He bakes the bricks in the fire, and out of the torsos of the animals, he builds the altar, and the heads he puts under the altar. Thus, he reunites the heads of the animals with the torsos in the fire altar, which is himself, his own Atman, and he becomes the fire. <laughs> so I told you, it's a bit different from the Buddhist idea of creation. Yeah? It's super duper colorful and, uh, and very hard to really relate to any clear sense of reality, it's mythology, yeah? Mythology big time. Uh, and uh, so you can see what the Buddha was up against. He was really up against something very, very different from the Buddhist thing. Buddha, so realistic, so down to earth, uh, and the Brahmanical teaching, so highfalutin, full of metaphor, full of mythology. And I'm sure this can be interpreted in some very interesting ways, yeah? if, you, if you know how to look at these things in the right way. I'm not going to try, because I don't really have enough experience in that. Uh, this is just to show you the contrast here between these things uh, and what the Buddha was dealing with. Uh. And then this book says uh, here that you can see here the close relationship between the two. Yeah? We may assume that the avidja, which is ignorance, uh, link refers to all the states of ignorance. Uh, which manifest themselves in, in cosmogony, cosmogony being the creation of the universe. So the sanskara link, which is the creation again, uh, refers to all the acts of the creative will to dispel that ignorance. And then the vijnana, which is the third part of dependent origination, yeah, you see how closely they relate to each other, refers to all subjective manifestation which realize this will. <laughs> This means that the sequence avidya, sanskara, vinyana can be used to express the whole Vedic creation. And in this sense, it is very close to Buddhism because Buddhism also really expresses the rebirth process through these three links. I'm going to go a bit fast now because it's not so important. This is just for a bit of interest. So what we have then, yeah, the creation of the world versus rebirth, Brahmanism versus Buddhism. So we start off that Brahmanism, you have ignorance of everything. Everything is ignorance. Whereas in Buddhism, you have the ignorance of specific things. The Buddha redefines the idea of ignorance. Yeah? And he, he limits it to the idea of delusion and illusion. 
Then in Brahmanism, you have the idea of that the Atman, you already have some idea of self, and then you want to build up that idea of self even further. This is this desire for the Atman. And how do you create that Atman? Through eating, killing, killing, and building altars. Yeah? So this is the, uh, the ancient way of thinking about the building up of things. Whereas the Buddha, he simply talks, he has a very different idea of creation. Creation happens through intentional actions. This is kamma. Yeah? And this is one of the very important distinctions between Buddhism and Brahmanism, in that in the ancient Brahmanism, actions had a kind of mythological uh, value. They had a value in ritual. They had a value as, um, as um, uh, that meant something else. Yeah? But you had to follow certain procedures because the action itself had value. Whereas in Buddhism, it moves on to intentional actions. It was one of the great uh, changes and the great innovations of Buddhism was the idea of bringing intention into action. And intentional actions uh, is what is considered moral or immoral. That is what matters. Uh, whereas in Brahmanism, it's all about uh, acting in certain ways. Yeah, you kill certain animals, you build an altar, and things kind of come, come uh, around in this way. Uh. So here the Buddha is taking the Atman out of things, uh, and he is imbuing the actions with uh, ethical value through intention. And then we have the last one, where the, in, in Brahmanism, uh, it is about the creation of the cosmos, uh, creation of human beings, and also the creation, building up of the inner self, uh, also sometimes through meditation practice, uh, whereas in Buddhism, it is about rebirth. The rebirth is the process of creation uh, in Buddhism. So, uh, there you are. It's just a very brief overview. I'm not going to spend more time on this. Maybe we can talk a bit more about some of these ideas uh, when we come to them in the various factors of dependent origination uh, later on down the track. Yeah. This is just to kind of tie things together a little bit with the pre-existing ideas. Uh, and if you want to read about it, you can. This book called uh, Playing with uh, Fire, I think it is available. Is it probably available on the internet? Uh, and uh, you can look it up, and uh, if you want it, I can, you can, I can always give it to you as well. It's kind of uh, interesting, but also a bit uh, heavy going, perhaps. Anyway, uh, it's way overdue to have a break, so let's have a break and uh, have a nice meditation together, and I will see you back again. What time again is it, uh, Lehar? So the meditation's at um, 3 o'clock, yeah. and then um, 